Okay. Got singles, yeah? It's good to be back. It's good to be back. Uh, usually I hear that from girls, not guys, but you know, I'll take it either way. All right. Um, so, what I want to talk to you guys about today is some really important shit, basically. Um, I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to lay out for you guys, step by step, what I do and how I think in game, right? What the process is, how I think about an interaction, how I think about um, what I'm doing with a girl, where I'm at, all those kind of things. Um, and basically, uh, there's going to be three sections to this. First section is the three factors that absolutely must be in place for you to get laid, no matter what your strategy. If it's cold approach, if it's social circle, if it's online game, these are the three things you have to have, period. All right, so we're going to go through that. Next thing we're going to go through, the models of attraction and models of cold approach game as I learn them. So for those of you who haven't been in the game since you know 2000 like I have, I'm going to go through all of the history, everything that's been shown to work since then till now, and show how it all kind of comes together, what all the good elements that have been lost were. And then finally, I'm going to talk about implementation. Because one of the biggest things I hear when I talk to people about like structuring their game or having a game plan is how do I actually do it? How do I actually use it? And especially, how do I do it without like getting in my head, or how do I do it um, without like not being fluid, or whatever? All right. So it's going to be those three different sections. It's going to be a lot of information. For those of you who have you know papers to take notes, by all means, do it. Um, for those of you who have phones, by all means, I don't mind. Take notes, learn, etc. Um, I don't want a lot of questions because we have a lot of material. However, I will break for questions at two distinct times because we have three sections. Between each section, I'll take questions. So if you have a burning question that you absolutely have to answer, have to have answered, feel free to ask it during that section. But I don't want like ten hands in the air every five seconds because it's really going to just mess up the flow and we'll be here all night because there's a, seriously a ton of material. I'm going to drop decades of material on you guys. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right? You guys excited? Woo! Yeah. All right. Um, just to kind of couch all this, I want to kind of ask you guys a couple questions. First question is, how many people, sometimes you're talking with a girl and you don't know what to do next? Did that ever happen? Yeah? yeah. Ever? ever? Like constantly? OK, good. All right? Or um, does it sometimes happen that you kind of know what to do next, but you're not sure how to do it? Right? You're like, I'm, I'm at point A, I got to get to point Z, and what the fuck? Right? That's what this is about. That's what today is about. The, the goal at the end of today is that you will always have a game plan. All right? You will always know where you're at, where you need to go, and you'll have a game plan or maybe six game plans um, to get you there. All right? So I don't want you guys to be at a loss ever again. So that's the idea. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about this. What gets guys laid? What are the three factors that absolutely must be in place to get guys laid? And I think you guys will agree with me as I show you them. First one, access. You have to have access to girls to get laid. It's hard to get laid when you're far apart from girls. It's a physical, it's a physical act, right? Um, so access, right? You need to find girls. And that can be done a lot of ways. It can be done you know, cold approach. It can be done social circle, online, whatever. But you've got to find girls some way. Secondly, attraction, right? And attraction can be phrased different ways, value, intrigue, interest, whatever. But you have to have some sort of like a decision on the girl's part that she likes you, chooses you, that you're special in some way. She has some sort, you have some sort of emotional relevance to her. Okay? So that's, that's attraction. And then finally, we have follow through. Okay? And follow through, it's a bit of a catch all, um, but basically it means once the girl likes you, not fucking it up. Right? Getting her from she likes you in a public place to she likes you in a private place where sex will happen. And that includes um, things like logistics, it includes things like not making her look slutty and feel slutty, um, it includes um, things like making her feel comfortable and making her trust you, all these other things that are parts of developing the relationship. All right? So no matter what way you meet a girl, you're probably going to need these three things. You're not going to sleep with a girl you don't have access to. You're not going to sleep with a girl who has no attraction or no desire whatsoever for you, unless you're paying for it. Um, and um, you're not going to sleep with a girl unless you do the follow through properly. All right? So those are the three elements that always need to be in place. All right? So whatever, whatever you're looking at, whether you're looking at um, pick up, um, cold approach, social circle, online, always think in terms of these three factors, right? How can I improve my access? How can I improve my follow through? How can I improve the attraction factor? Let's go a little deeper though. So these are basically the three pillars. If you're missing any of these three pillars, um, you will have a problem, right? Without any of these, the triangle falls apart and you're wasted. All right. Let's talk about access. There's a lot of ways to get access to girls. Right? You can get access to girls through a cold approach, walking up and talking to strangers. You can get access to girls through shared activities. This is how most guys in the world get access to girls. Right? They go to school and they sleep with or try to sleep with girls from their school. Or they go to work and you know, they meet like, you know, Susie that works at the desk next to them. Right? 
Um, social circle, right? And that, that involves you know having cool friends, having activities. Shared activities and social circle really do intersect a lot because a lot of times you go to school with people and they're in your social circle, etc. Um, but you can have a social circle without shared activities. And really popular people, very social people, tend to have a social circle outside of their activities. Um, online, uh, one of the most abundant sources of women, especially in the current modern day. And the, the last one is some sort, sort of fame, having something that draws girls to you. So if you are a famous actor, a famous musician, um, a DJ, anything like that, or if you're famous within um, a social circle, right? If you're in college and you're in a fraternity and you're well known in that fraternity, that's a form of fame, right? If you um, are an athlete in college and you get you know, put on stage every now and again, that's a form of fame. It doesn't have to be global fame, it can be local. Even if you are like theoretically like the captain of your chess team, you know, the girls that are in the chess club, you have a little bit of fame in that context, all right? So there is global and local fame. In fact, when I was growing up, I had, I had no global fame, but I did have local fame as like, you know, academically as like the, the nerdy guy that the nerdy girls wanted. So I'm, I'm well aware of that one. All right, so these are ways you can get access. Understand that you don't have to be doing cold approach to get access. However, there are pros and cons to all of these, right? And we're going to talk about what are good access strategies. A good strategy for getting access needs to be these characteristics. First of all, it has to be plausible. There has to be a good reason why you're there and it has to make sense. For example, imagine you are 50 years old and you want to go pick up girls on a college campus. Not to say that age is a problem, not to say that a 50-year-old guy can't be with 18-year-old girls, because he certainly can. Definitely, I've seen it, I plan on doing it when I'm 50. <laughs> however, however, there's a very good and reasonable question, what the fuck are you doing on a college campus in the first place, right? So the very fact that you're there conveys some sort of agenda, conveys that there's something going on that maybe is, is a little odd, right? So it makes it a little implausible, right? One of the great things about um, something like online game is it's completely plausible, right? Everybody's agreed to be there, everybody knows why you're there, it's up front, and so there's no plausibility issue, okay? Um, cold approach is not the most plausible a lot of times, right? One of the struggles actually with cold approach, one of the things that the experts at cold approach game do that other guys don't, is they make that cold approach plausible. They make it make sense, they make it seem like it just happened, they make it seem normal, instead of seeming like a big put on event. Um, next though, abundant and scalable. And this, oh by the way, um, plausible for plausibility, um, shared activities and social circle are actually probably the best. Right? If you want plausible access, you go to school with a girl, she sits in the desk, ne desk next to you, you have the most plausible access ever, right? or you're in a fraternity or sorority, hopefully you're not in a sorority, but you're in a fraternity, <laughs> and um, you know, the girls that are in that sorority, there's a lot of plausible access there. The problem with those kind of strategies, though, is the next one, which is they're not abundant and scalable. Right? The problem with social circle game is that it works within that social circle, but it doesn't work in the whole broad world. So let's say you have a really tight group of like, attractive friends here in New York, right? but now you go to, I don't know, somewhere in Asia, all of a sudden, you don't have that social circle. You go to Australia or Canada, wherever, right? So you can't take it with you. It's not abundant, it's not scalable. Online's pretty abundant and scalable as well, right? At least if you live in a big city, to a point. Um, cold approach is completely abundant and scalable. And that's one of the most beautiful things about a cold approach st uh, strategy is that you can go anywhere, meet a girl anytime. And that's actually why I love cold approach, right? Every girl is out somewhere in life available to be cold approach, so it gives you complete access, complete abundance. Finally, whatever you're doing must be well-framed. Okay? And what I mean by well-framed is it shouldn't put you in a position of low value, putting you in a position where you look needy, try hard, desperate, et cetera. Right? And again, the different strategies are better and worse in terms of this. So for example, online game, not necessarily the best frame sometimes. Right? Online game, why are you online? Why don't you already have a girlfriend? Right? It's something that you have to get over. Um, cold approach game, depending on the nature of how you do it, sometimes not well-framed. Right? Why did you, you know, have to run up to me and, and approach me in this situation? Don't you already have a girlfriend? It's, it's a little um, not the most normal. Now, it can be framed. If you do it better, it's framed better. But again, the framing's there. Um, again, in terms of this, things like social circle game, um, things like um, friends of friends, those kind of things, shared activities, tend to be the best, best framed. And the absolute best framed way is fame. Right? If you're famous and they come to you, or if you have some kind of social proof, and they come to you. That's the best framed. Okay? And we're going to talk about social proof. That'll come a little bit later. But um, social proof, not just in the sense of having friends and having people like you, but also implying social proof, implying through your actions, implying through your words, implying through the way you carry yourself. 
that you are popular and have a good life. That's very, very plausible, and it's very important for framing when you're talking about things like a cold approach. Okay? So this is access, right? If you want a good access strategy, and everybody should be thinking this. If you want to get laid, you should be thinking, how am I going to meet, how and where am I going to meet girls? Right? And then is it plausible? Is what I'm doing plausible? Is it abundant and scalable? Is it well framed? And to the extent that it's not, how can I improve those aspects? Right? So that's the first thing we have to think about is where and how am I meeting? Um, next, attraction. Right? What is attraction? Basically, the idea in attraction is it's very nebulous. There's a lot of things in it, but basically the idea is in some sort of evolutionary or value context, the girl is better off getting your seed than some random guy's seed. Right? That's, that's what it basically comes down to. Um, and this can be for a variety of factors. It can be because you look genetically big and strong. It can be because you have good social feedback. It could be because you seem rich and powerful and successful. Um, it could be for a lot of different things. Okay? But the idea here is there's some reason why she's chosen that with you, some reason why it's a win for her. That's a big thing to keep in mind um, throughout all of game. It should be a win for her. If she's winning by sleeping with you, she probably will. If she's losing by sleeping with you, she probably won't. It's just that binary. Um, and again, this can take many forms. Um, genetic indicators, social proof. Um, there's this great idea. Who here knows what an honest signal is in terms of evolution? About half the room? OK, cool. So an honest signal is something that's attractive and cannot be faked. All right. The example that's given in evolution a lot of times is the peacock's feathers. Um, they're brightly colored, um, which means he has to have vitamins in his diet, so he has to be healthy in order to make those colors. And also the fact that they're brightly colored makes him a target for predators. So if he can survive with the brightly colored feathers, he must be very, very adept. Right? Um, and so it's, it's an honest signal, something that can't be faked, that says, I have good genetics. Right? There's the same kind of thing for people. Right? So things like a good physique, symmetry, those kind of things are an honest genetic signal. Things like social proof, having people talk well about you, having people say things about you, it's very hard to fake. Right? It's very easy for you to brag about yourself. Hey, girl, I got all this stuff going on. I'm so good. I'm the shit. Right? Anybody can do that. But if 10 other people have already told her about her before she meets you, that's a lot harder to fake. Now, if you're very clever, you could fake that. Right? <laughs> But that's much more difficult. So it's considered a much more honest signal. Right? So the harder something is to fake, the more honest it is. Also, generally, um, things that are more negative tend to be more honest. Things that are more positive tend to be more dishonest, because you have more reason to fake the positive than the negative. It's a very unfortunate consequence of this. All right? But anything that's an honest display is, is considered in terms of the girl's level of attraction for you. Um, displays of competence. If you're good at shit, girls will respond to that, even if it's silly stuff. Right? I'm, I'm telling you, I got girls off of a little bit. Not, I didn't actually get them because I didn't know how to follow through. But I got attraction from girls off of being good at school and good at chess as a kid. I swear to you. I kid you not. Right? Any kind of competence will get you some sort of attraction. Um, and then abundance, resources, and power are very, very powerful um, as, um, as forms of attraction. And especially as you get older as a man, these become more and more useful. Because at a certain sense, if, if you're getting older, if you're in your like 40s, 50s, 60s, um, and you don't have any resources, and you don't have any power, there's this kind of like, what's he doing with his life kind of thing. Right? Whereas at 18, you're not expected to have a lot of resources and power yet. Right? So you need to kind of ideally have at least something of a semblance of what you kind of should have at your age, and it will be helpful. Now, you, you can succeed without any of these, but they all definitely help. Um, finally, we have follow through. And so as I say here, it's a general cocktail of not fucking up. Right? Um, but it comes down to a lot of different things. First of all, is the girl comfortable with you? And here I want to make a point. Because most people in game get the idea of comfort wrong. Okay? The idea of comfort, most people are like, oh, she like, you know, you have things in common. You have shared interests. That's a little bit of comfort. And the reason, by the way, that that helps the girl out is that if you have shared interests, she's equating you with all the other people she's had shared interests with, who are people she probably trusted. So therefore, by association, she trusts you. Right? But what you actually really want, the comfort you want, is what I call high value comfort. High value comfort means she's comfortable that being with you won't be a degradation of her. Right? She's comfortable that it won't make her look slutty, won't make her look bad socially, won't give her a venereal disease, um, won't listen, have her have like a kid inside her that has bad genetics or will not be raised by his father, those kind of things. Okay? So it's, it's comfort that it won't be a loss. That's what it really comes down to. It's not about if you have the same favorite color. Okay? That really doesn't matter very much. Okay, but a lot of guys get that wrong, like, oh, you know, I, this girl and I, we, 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 we like the same music and have the same color. Why didn't she like me and sleep with me? Right? That's not the most important factor. Um, proper escalation. Okay? 
knowing how to escalate without making the girl nervous and uncomfortable is so, so, so critical. Right? If you either don't ever get physical or don't ever bring up the ideas of sex, you're not going to get laid at all. If you do it in a way that creeps her out, makes her uncomfortable, you're going to have big problems. And actually, proper escalation is another form of value as well. Right? If you know how to escalate, what does that say about your sexual history? Right? It says, I've been with girls before. Girls have liked me before, which also says you can be comfortable that being with me won't be a loss. Right? Um, managing logistics, getting her from point A to point B without it being awkward, without her being slutty, et cetera. Uh, managing the peer group so she doesn't appear slutty and so that you can get isolation, get to sex. Um, and then maintaining um, attraction through the comfort phase. We'll talk about that a lot more later when we get into structured game, but that's absolutely critical. That's one of the biggest failings with guys who have a structured game plan. So we'll talk about that more later. Okay, but let's follow through. All right, so you guys see how those three pillars work, right? You need to be able to access the girls, you need to be able to track the girls, and then you need to be able to follow through. If any of those are missing, you're fucked. Right? And that's going to become very important as you start talking about the models, because a lot of the models are good in one area, but they break down somewhere else. All right, let's talk about models of game. And we're going to go in the order that I learned them. Right? There's a lot of subjective ways we could do this. I'm going to do it in the order that I learned them from a teenage boy all the way to today. So the first one is one you guys have probably never heard of, because it's in some obscure book from the 1970s. All right? Um, and this is the attractive qualities model. This is basically, when I was um, digging through my, my father's porn collection, I found this book in with the <laughs> porno magazines. So anyway, but it actually has some good information, has some really good information. And basically, what they've done in this book is they did a survey of hundreds of women, and they, they basically tried to suss out what are the qualities that those women liked in men, right? Men they dated, men they've been attracted to, et cetera. Um, and they came up with basically what they, what they boiled down to five qualities. And those were attractiveness, attentiveness, assertiveness, assuredness, and aliveness. And we're going to run through briefly what all of those are. So first of all, attractiveness. This does not mean being like chiseled and having abs, although that, is, that does help. right? But it doesn't mean just that. What it really means is doing the most that you can with, with your look. Okay? So it means having good haircut, having good style, being in the gym, all those kind of things. Um, in fact, a lot of girls surveyed um, mentioned that they were with guys that or were with or had been attracted to guys who had actually ugly faces, but their overall impression was just very, very good, right? Um, and so, as men, we're lucky in that sense. As women, women are being judged very much on just the physical. For us, as guys, we're being judged as the message being conveyed by the physical a lot, all right? So there's a lot you can do with your attractiveness. So it's not just being in the gym and having good physique, although you guys all should do that, okay? Because why not? it's only going to help, right? It's another factor in this. But it's not just that. And it's not just about being genetically attractive or being perfectly symmetrical or being a model or anything like that, OK? Um, next, um, attentiveness. And this is an interesting one. This, this actually kind of, um, if, I, if I were to rewrite this list, I would put it deeper down in the list, because I want to get to it later. But actually, fuck it. We'll do that one last, because um, I can. Um, assertiveness. Assertiveness basically means saying what you want, doing what you want, standing up for what you want, those kind of things, right? And why is that attractive to women? Because it indicates you're a leader. It indicates high social status. If you're unwilling to be assertive, if you're unwilling to speak your mind and stand up for yourself, what does that say about your history in life? That you were able to get away with this. Exactly. That when you stood up for yourself, someone was like, get the fuck out of here, loser. Or like punched you in the face, right? Um, but if you are willing to be assertive, that says when I've asserted myself, when I've tried to stand up for myself, when I've asked for what I wanted, I've received a positive response. Right? And so it's a clear indicator of high status, clear indicator of leadership, et cetera. So being assertive is very, very good. I'll tell you guys a quick story. The first date I ever went on in my entire life um, in high school, um, basically, I, I didn't know how to run a date. I probably would have just gone nowhere with it. But this, this girl that I was with actually kind of knew and like I think had set it up so that we would kind of be in a situation where good things could happen. So basically, we went and met one of her friends and like had a quick chat. And then we went to go rent a movie and then go back to her place and watch the movie. Sounds like a pretty good layout for a date, right? So but I was trying so hard to be perfect on this date. that, And this was my first date. And I was so nervous. I didn't know what to do. I spent probably half an hour perusing the movies, trying to like pick just the, just the right perfect movie for the date. So eventually, she just got pissed off and said, we're taking this one and just left. It was fed up with me and like nothing doing the rest of the date. Right? Even though it had been all set up and it was all laid out. And funny enough, like before even like going on the date with her, I'd gotten physical with her just outside of even asking for the date. Once I got back to her place on the date, we didn't even touch. Like didn't even hold hands, didn't even touch, whatever. Because I had just fucked it all up through lack of assertiveness, lack of willingness to make a decision, lack of willingness to say, this is the movie I want. 
Right? I was like, maybe do you want this one? Or have you seen this? Right? I was being too accommodating. Immediate turnoff. Okay. Um, assuredness. Now, assuredness seems similar to assertiveness. Assuredness means like being self-assured, being confident that you're that you're high quality, that you're the best, maybe even being a little bit cocky, right? Especially when it comes to escalating. Like if you go to touch a girl and you're hesitant, you're like, can I maybe touch you here? Immediately turned off, right? But if you do it with confidence, like you believe it's going to work, even if you do it a little bit wrong, you'll usually get away with it. Okay, so assuredness is believing that you are of high value and she will respond well to you. Now this is distinct from assertiveness, uh, from, sorry, from assertiveness, because you could be assertive and not assured. Right? You could be the person that stands up for himself but is uncomfortable. Hey, excuse me, I, I did, can I maybe say so, you know, You could be that person, assertive but not assured. You could also be assured but not assertive in the sense that um, you could be very confident with a girl one-on-one, -on -one, but as soon as there's other people around, you're like afraid to touch her, afraid to make a move, afraid to address them. A lot of pickup artists are this way when the girl has friends with them. Right? One-on-one, -on -one, you're just fine. As soon as the girl's come, friends come, I'm like, no, I wasn't doing pickup. I promise. No, I would never. No. Uh-uh. <laughs> right? That's assured but not assertive. All right? Um, last one, or second to last one as we're doing it is aliveness. And that means just basically like being willing to take risks, being willing to bring some energy and spark to the conversation. Just think of this as being non-boring. Right? Like, for example, if, um, say you're with a girl and things are going well and she goes, hey, let's go skinny dipping. You're like, oh, no, I just don't really feel like immediate turnoff. Okay? Not very alive. Not very much fun. I mean, imagine, imagine having sex with the guy that doesn't want to go skinny dipping. Right? It's like, it, it, you just don't envision it quite as well. Right? It doesn't seem as much fun. Right? So aliveness, being willing to take risks. Um, this is actually a big reason why um, girls will get into guys that ride motorcycles, guys that fight even, those kind of things. It's fun, it's exciting, it's emotionally stimulating. Even if logically like that's fucking stupid, they're still emotionally stimulated by it. All right? um, and then last one is attentiveness. The reason I bring this one up last is because as I'm going to bring up all the other models, um, there's this value comfort kind of conundrum. Attentiveness really falls into a comfort category more than a value category. Attentiveness means that you actually give a shit about the girl and will pay some attention to her. Right? Um, I guess a good example of this would be um, a lot of times in relationships, girls will pick fights with you. Right? And early on in the relationship or during a pickup, a girl picking a fight with you might be like a test of your frame, to test if you're going to give in to her. Right? A lot of times later on in a relationship, a girl will pick a fight with you to see if you actually fight back. Because if you're too dismissive, if you don't seem to care, that's going to make her feel uncomfortable. That's going to make her feel like whatever you have with her isn't special. Does that make sense? Right? And so that, that sort of fact that you do care a little bit makes a difference. Or the fact that in your, as you're escalating physically, you take care to go slowly enough that it feels good for her. Right? You take care to, you know, instead of just ripping, well, sometimes you can just rip her clothes off, and that's good, right? But instead of just automatically ripping her clothes off thoughtlessly, maybe you take the time to, like, you know, kiss her a few places, caress a few places, take your time with the foreplay. That attentiveness indicates um, that the life that you're bringing her into will be more fun for her. It also indicates some sort of sexual competence, right? So that, that willingness to be attentive to her, that willingness to treat her as a little bit special, definitely will help girls out down the road. Okay, so those are the, the big factors. The other thing that I learned from this book was aggressive eye contact. And I mean like fucking aggressive, okay? In this book, they basically recommended like staring slash leering at girls, like constantly, right? And you know what? It kind of works. It actually fucking works. Um, so I did this in class. I was in, like in middle school. And, and they, they recommended this like heavy-lidded kind of stare. We're like, <laughs> like staring at the girl. So I'm like in, in class, like staring at the girl across the room from me like this. And it actually fucking worked. It actually would get me attracted. It actually get the girls very intrigued. At first, like they'd, they'd like look away and then look back and be like, what's going on? But eventually, they'd get like mesmerized and hold eye contact. And there was this like connection from across the room. It was pretty good. Um, it's a little weird, a little creepy. But it actually, for, for a guy who had never done anything sexual with a girl, like a, a young teenage guy, it was pretty amazing to see those results. And it does show the power of eye contact. Very, very, very useful. Um, so the result of this for me as a teenage boy, I got attraction from girls in the class um, in kind of like a, a creepy, like weird fucking way. Um, I got attraction, but there's no follow through. Because this model, it has the pros of telling you how to be an attractive man. What are the attractive qualities? But the problem is if you look at these, um, a lot of these, they're sort of non-contact events, right? You're being attractive in isolation from the girl, right? If you become a more assertive person in general, the girl may see that, but it's not directly like you're communicating and talking with the girl and taking it somewhere and going on a date, 
right? So there's no actual interaction, right? It's kind of like the guy who, um, I, I joke around about this, like in, in, who wants to do a cold approach by going to a club and sitting in the corner and just being like, I'm James Bond, and not talking to anybody, right? He might be the coolest guy, but nobody has any access to the fact that he's cool because he's actually not breaking that like conversational barrier, right? So with girls who actually did it have to interact with me, I actually got a little more attraction from this, but it wasn't really doing it in terms of um, meeting them. Also, there's no follow through. The, the problem I had too is these girls would get attracted to me, I'm like, then what? I didn't know how to take them on a date, didn't know how to talk to them, didn't know how to escalate physically, and it just would go nowhere, right? So it's a limited model, but it's something. Uh, the next one I learned is a really great book that I read, which I recommend to anyone and everyone on learning how to talk. There's a book called Making People Talk by Barry Farber. It's an incredible book. Basically, this guy was a radio interviewer, right? That's his job is he's on radio, people get on a show, and he has to interview them and make them interesting on air. Um, and so his whole idea was it, in order to be a good conversationalist, it's not about you talking at them, it's about getting them to talk. And by the way, this concept is one of the things most missing in the current model of pickup, right? Most guys in pickup are just talking at the girl and talking at the girl and talking at the girl, and the girl's not participating, right? Learn this, learn this. The idea, the goal at the start of a pickup is to get her to talk, is to get her to invest and to get her to participate. That's the biggest thing you can be doing, okay? Um, so just that idea of making people talk is huge. But what this guy basically did is, he gave this book as a treatise on how to start a conversation with a stranger and how to make it a conversation that the stranger wants to be a part of, okay? Now, the failing of this book from a pickup standpoint is he didn't make the distinction of male and female strangers very much. It's just how to talk to a stranger, period. So it doesn't say a whole lot about sexualizing or, or any of that kind of stuff, but it is really good for talking. And here are some rules. First rule, assume the burden of the interaction, okay? When you go up and talk to a girl or any stranger, um, it's your job to make the conversation happen, not theirs. So if you go up and go, you say hi, and they go, hey, and then you just sit there, you fucked up, okay? They weren't planning to talk to you, they weren't prepared to talk to you, you have to assume the burden. You have to carry the conversation on your shoulders for usually the first 30 seconds or a minute, all right? Um, and this is what's known as the 90-10 rule, right? You guys may have heard that one, 90-10 rule. Now, the problem with the 90-10 rule from, again, this making people talk perspective is this. It should be 90-10 as long as it has to be, but remember what the core goal is. The core goal is to make her talk, all right? So guys get in this 90-10 idea, right? So there's, there's two mistakes guys make. One is they go up and just expect the girl to carry the conversation. Hey, what's up? I'm here. Oh, shit, nothing happened? Oh, oops, my bad. The other one is they go 90-10 for six hours straight. Right? They just talk at the girl and talk at the girl and talk at the girl and don't let the girl talk. So what you actually want to do is this. Assume the burden up until the place where she's willing to talk. As soon as she's willing to talk, that's what you actually want, okay? So 90-10 because you have to, but only for as long as you have to. The goal is to sit back and let her talk. Um, and then the other things that, that he would really work on in, in, in talking to people is make the other person feel important. Make the other person feel like the most special person in the world. Because if someone, and this makes sense, if someone when they're with you feels special and feels like the center of attention and feels like they're really cool, they're associating that feeling with you and they want further conversations with you where they feel special and cool and important. All right, so that's the general idea here. Um, now, from a pickup perspective, the problem here is that um, the girl might not care enough about your opinion of her to stay long enough for this to happen in some context, right? Um, or she may, not, she may not care enough in terms of, like if you make her feel too special and important, she may like enjoy the conversation in terms of this guy's amusing and fun, but not in terms of I want his penis, right? So there's a little difference there, but it is very useful. Um, the other thing that was very much brought home to me from, from reading this book is the importance of words, right? If pickup and, and talking to girls is a verbal art, it's a verbal endeavor. So the more that you study words, the more that you study humor, the more that you have a good vocabulary, um, the more that we'll talk about frame control and shit tests and those kind of things, the more adept you are verbally, the better off you're gonna be with girls. And this is actually becoming even more important as we move to a world that has more online game and more social media, right? Because you can't convey a lot of body language through those channels, it's gotta be words, right? So learning and working on your words is critically, critically important. Um, so basically, I took this, went to college, and I got probably two dates every single weekend. And I went for 10 months before I got my first kiss. Right? Because what I was doing here is I was, the one thing, one thing I've always done really well is I've always taken a model and followed it really, really well. So if the model was incomplete, my game was definitely incomplete. 
right? So this is an incomplete model. It didn't teach me how to get sexual, but it taught me how to get dates. So I was getting date after date after date, never, ever, ever kissed a girl because there was nothing sexual in this model. But if you want to get social dates, absolutely a brilliant model. In fact, if you know how to escalate later and escalate on the date, this model actually is, is pretty good there as well. But you've got to be able to escalate at some point. That's what's missing here. That's the biggest thing that's missing. Um, it's also an early game model, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. OK, so that was the next thing. Still not getting laid, though. Like, if you look at my personal history, I'm getting some dates now, getting talking to girls, still not getting laid. All right, how many of you guys have heard of a book called Double Your Dating? Oh. Yeah? How many of you guys have read this book? Yeah? Some? No? One, two? Just a few? We know who's really been in the pickup community for a while now. So Double Your Dating was a book by a man named David D'Angelo, um, which for me was absolutely groundbreaking. And for the pickup community, to be fair, it was pretty groundbreaking. Um, and basically, if I were to sum up in two words what this book was about, it's called cocky funny. Right? Those are the two things you're trying to be. You're trying to be cocky. Um, and to be fair, like a lot of his funny wasn't really that funny. But it's like, it's like cocky and like challenging. Or cocky and like, um, and like a little bit shocking. Like cocky and shocking, cocky and challenging would probably almost be a better phrase for it than cocky and funny. Because it wasn't like comedic. But the thing here is, you're going up to a girl, and here's what's brilliant about it. You're telling her, I'm amazing, one way or another. And that's a beautiful thing. Right? Because if you go up to a girl and tell her you're amazing, what's her option? What can she do with that? Right? She can either accept that you're amazing, which that seems to work pretty well, right? or she can challenge that you're amazing, in which case now you're in a back and forth, you're in verbal banter, and good things can happen. Right? And so just that permission to like be a little bit cocky, that permission to be a little shocking, um, was really, really powerful for me and powerful for tons and tons of guys. Um, and then the other thing that he taught in that book, because I'm sure that by doing that he got shit tested like a motherfucker, was how to pass shit tests. And basically he taught one technique for passing shit tests, which is a technique called misinterpretation. Right? Misinterpretation basically means treat it like it was a compliment. So if the girl goes, ew, that shirt's so black, you go, oh, glad you like it. Right? That would like be like the, the, the W dating response to everything, oh, glad you like it. Or what is it about black shirts you like so much? Right? <laughs> But so it's, it's very formulaic. It's very predictable once you've kind of read it and seen it. But it does have that element that you are making things sexually charged. You are taking a risk. Does that make sense? All right. Now, so with this, I actually started getting attraction. I actually did get laid once I, st once I started using these techniques, et cetera. Um, I was pretty close before with the other techniques, so I might have gotten there eventually. But this definitely put me over the top. Um, however, in my career teaching pickup, I've seen a lot of guys who did this style of game and like, like learned just this. And um, I ha we had kind of an uh, affectionate phrase for them. We called them cocky, funny cockheads. Um, because guys that were just being cocky, funny, cocky, funny, cocky, funny, what would end up happening is that they're ending up like just trolling the girl and not actually taking it in a direction. Right? So it's just like they're just making fun of the girl and just being a dick because they found that they can get away with it. And the girl will tolerate it for a bit and tolerate it for a bit, but then eventually she won't. And so they'd end up with these like, very fun, interesting interactions, but not getting a lot of sex. Right? And, and it's because, basically, I mean, it's a model that has attraction in it, but no comfort. Right? So to kind of understand that, there's a, there's a great Warren Buffett phrase, which I like. They say, like, any, he says, any long, string of, of no, any, any long string of big numbers multiplied together with even one zero in the string always equals zero. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, so the double your dating model was a little bit like that. It was a little bit like if you were gonna like if you were like went to go went to the casino and you just bet on black and you just keep doubling down over and over and over again, right? So the first time 50-50 you're gonna win or end up with zero. Next time 50-50 you win more or end up with zero. Next time 50-50 you end up, win more or end up with zero, right? And so you're gonna leave the casino like almost every single time at zero. One time in like a blue moon you're gonna end up with like this massive stack of cash, right? The problem with that though is if you think of like getting laid as, as a, a, like a monetary amount, you don't need a massive stack of cash to get laid. You need like a small stack of cash, right? Like a decent sized stack of cash, right? So basically, you're either massively overkill and just like frying the girl's circuits and getting laid like one time in like hundreds, and then 99 times out of 100 fucking it up and just blowing the setup. Does that make sense? Because it's this very, very, um, um, very one size fits all button pushing model, right? And girls tend to see right through it. However, it is good for getting attraction. So it's good as far as it goes. Does that make sense? All right, cool. Um, boom. Next. Who's here, to, who's here to this one? Speed seduction. You guys know this one? How many people have tried speed seduction? Nobody was bold enough? 
Nobody was daring enough to try it? NLP. NL NLP, yeah. N NLP as per Ross Jeffries, but yes. Yeah. yeah. You tried it? Okay, good. I like it. I like it. Somebody's been around as long as I have. It's good. Um, so speed seduction is really interesting. Really, really interesting. Um, I'll, you know, can cut to the bottom here. Actually made me worse, but it did open my eyes. Um, and actually, even though it particularly made my results a little worse when I was trying it, it is probably the most brilliant model to have come out up to its time. Um, and it included a lot of beautiful things that, that didn't um, exist before. For those of you who don't know what speed seduction is, here's basically what it is. Speed seduction is the use of something called neurolinguistic programming, which means communicating with a girl in, um, in a way that's meant to lead her mind psychologically. Right? What it meant in practice was saying and doing a lot of things that were meant to put sexual thoughts into a girl's head. So an example is this. Um, you guys have all heard the, heard the phrase, um, don't think of a pink elephant. What are you guys all thinking of right now? Pink elephant, right? So the idea here would be, um, maybe I would say, oh, you know, my friend told me the funniest story it was so crazy, and then say like this blatantly sexual thing, right? So what you've done is you've relieved yourself of the responsibility of saying it by saying it was your friend, and then you tell this very sexual story. And in order for her to understand that very sexual story, she has to imagine it, right? Right? Like, for example, if I were to tell all of you not to think of a penis right now, <laughs> sorry I did that to you. Sorry I did that to you, right? But it's, it's kind of hard to avoid. And then as you're thinking about that, you might think like to yourself, oh shit, I just thought of this guy's penis. Am I actually a little gay? Right? <laughs> it's hard to unthink these things. Right? So that's, that's a very non-subtle version of planting ideas and suggestions in your head. Right? <clears throat> the other thing this did um, was leading the conversation in sexual directions. And it really emphasized storytelling, which is one of the most powerful things in game. Right? Telling stories is hugely powerful. Right? By telling a story, you can communicate ideas, communicate emotions and feelings, and you can let someone get to know you all at once. Right? So to be actively telling stories as part of your game was absolutely massive. The other thing here was frame control. Right? So in the double your dating model, there was frame control in a, pa in a reactive sense, as in the girl gives you a shit test, and you're going to use frame control to get around that shit test. And there's a little bit of active frame control, although there was one frame, which is I'm amazing. Right? I'm amazing, and you're attracted to me. I noticed. Right? That was like the, that'd be like the classic W dating opener. I noticed you're attractive to me. Or attracted to me. I'm sorry. You are kind of attractive, but anyway, whatever. OK. So here, you're getting sexual. Right? And I messed around with this, and it was actually really, really kind of freaky. Right? So what I, what I did with this is um, I, I, can, I, I can think of two kind of situations that that were just that I did this were very un unusual. One was I went on a coffee date with a girl, and I started doing these like speed seduction patterns, which are like these routines and stories that are meant to be like all sexual and lead the, lead the mind. And I'm at a Starbucks, and I, like this girl and I are like holding hands on the Starbucks table, and she just like closed her eyes, was like mm, 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 at Starbucks. I was like, well, okay, that's fucking cool. Like I'd never seen that before. This is amazing. This is working. And then I tried to get her to go you know, anywhere else with me from Starbucks. And she got really nervous, like, no, 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 I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Because she was weirded out by how attracted she had been. She was weirded out by the fact that she'd just done what she'd done in public. She's weirded out by the fact that she didn't know me. And like, it, was all, it was all very sexual, without anything friendly, without anything like in terms of getting to know each other on a factual level, et cetera. Right? So it didn't really work. I had another similar situation um, to that in, um, in my college library like, like a little while later. Right? Whereas, like, again, girl getting very aroused in like, a public place, but then when it went to like, getting her home or getting her on a date later, it was extremely flaky, extremely weird. Um, but very eye-opening. Like, very eye-opening that I was getting those kind of reactions. Um, and to be fair, I, again, I never got laid directly with speed seduction. However, later on in my game, I do use it um, in the bedroom, and I do use it late on in an interaction sometimes, or little elements of it. So there are a lot of good little bits of it. OK? Um, so that's. Um, speed seduction. OK. Um, and that brings us to to structured game. All right? And that's, this is where you're starting to get into a more robust model of game. All right? And I want to I wanna kind of, most of, a lot of you know the current structured game. Most of you probably don't know this one, the original mystery model of game. How many people have seen this? FMAC? You, uh, you've seen everything. <laughs> All right, so this is basically FMAC means find, meet, attract, close. OK? And I kind of want to talk to you about this model as a structured game when looking at the other models because it, um, it's going to highlight them really well. So as far as close, right? as far as the close part, basically that's speed seduction at this point. 
right? Because speed seduction is go in and like walk up to a stranger and just close, right? Just walk up and just start talking sexual and close and try and try and make it work, right? Now, if you were to walk up to the girl in her bedroom somehow as your first meeting, that could work, but most of the time it's not going to work in public, right? So speed seduction is like it's like just just the C in FMAC, right? If you look at the um, the double year dating model, it's just the A. Right? It's just attract, 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 and just keep attracting until her circuits fry. Right? If you look at the, um, the, um, the gig making her talk, uh, making people talk model, right? that's basically meet. Right? It's just meet, 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 but there's no attraction and no close. So you're just making friends. Right? So you can see all these models that were before, they all had really good elements, but the problem was there was no, no structure, no direction to it. Right? And to be fair, this is what I see with a lot of guys in game nowadays. I see a lot of guys will go out, um, tell me if this is familiar to you. You go out, you tease the girl, you attract the girl, it's going well, but then you're like, oh shit, what now? Yeah. Does that ever happen? Right? Absolutely. That's basically you're doing the double your dating model, essentially. Now, you're probably doing it a little more calibrated because there's a lot more technology now, but you're essentially doing that model, right? Or do you ever find yourself in the half hour conversation in nowhere? where you're just talking to girls and it's just like platonic, platonic, and you just can't seem to take it anywhere else, right? What are you doing? You're doing just the meat model. You're basically doing the making her talk model of game, right? So all of these models are sort of contained into the, um, the, the later models that have come. And if you understand the pros and cons, you understand what works within those earlier models, you'll understand how to do the later models. So basically, the biggest thing that, that this did for me was give me a frame of reference for all the other models. Where do these pieces actually fit in? How can I use them? i.e. there's a sequencing, right? Walk out and do the making people talk model, then do some W dating model, then do some speed seduction model. Done. Close. Right? It actually kind of works. Um, the other thing that, that maybe Mystery's most brilliant work to the pickup community ever is group theory, how to open groups. Right? And in this find, meet, attract, close model, he basically taught group theory. And that's like, before that, I had gone around my college campus, and whenever I saw a group of girls, I would literally like stalk them to wait for the wounded gazelle to leave the herd, oh, so I could run in for a 30-second talk to her and run away before her friends caught me. Okay. Once I learned how to approach groups, now I could actually, you know, talk to people in a normal social way. I could go to parties and like actually talk to the girl I wanted. It was, it was amazing. So that's another thing that came out of this, which is absolutely beautiful. All right. Um, now, the, the structured game I'm going to talk about the most and, and the models I'm going to talk about the most here are the current structured game models. So we're talking about advanced structured game and then we'll talk about so-called natural game um, as, as two different models and, and how they kind of work. So you can say this is Mystery 2.0 or you can say it's the early uh, the RSD model prior to 2006, maybe 2007, something like that. Um, they're essentially the same because they were the same company at one point, and they taught the same shit after they split. Um, but basically, um, the mystery one be open, attraction, comfort, and close with like you know numbers A1, A2, A3, C1, C2, C3 under comfort eventually. And then the RSD one be open, hook, connection, which is basically comfort, emotional and physical, and then close. So it's essentially the same model. It's essentially the same idea, um, but it has a sequence. And you'll notice it's very similar to the find, meet, attract, close model. right? And the brilliance of this for cold approach is that what you actually want to be doing in game, and this is very important, like if you like are thinking game, what you want to be doing, you want to be spending most of your time in comfort and closing. That's how your game should look, right? Most of you who have watched infield footage probably think the opposite, right? You think it's all about getting big reactions and having girls go, oh my god, right? That's not what game is. Game is not about how many oh my gods you get in the public club, it's how many oh my gods you get in the bedroom, okay? <laughs> all right. So it's about connection and closing. The hooking and attraction stuff is just to get you there, right? That's only to make you relevant enough to the girl that she wants to connect and be closed, right? So understand that. Um, but in a cold approach setting, if you just walk straight in and look for comfort, um, it looks very kind of low value. It looks very, very try hard. Um, and the girl doesn't have a reason to want to connect with you, right? And actually, um, when we talk about the structured game, the single biggest place where people would lose, uh, lose girls was right here, between attraction and comfort. Because right? there was this idea, basically the way structured game went was you open and you have like these stories you're telling or whatever. Right? And then attraction is you know, teasing, uh, you know, hands off the merchandise, you and I won't get along, back turn, all this kind of stuff. Right? And it actually works really, really well, really well. 
Um, and then you're going to go into comfort, which is, oh, hey, I actually really like you. You're actually kind of special, et cetera. The problem is a couple things. It's massively incongruent. Right? First of all, hey, hands off the merchandise. I don't like you. You're fuck off. You bleh, yuck. Wow, you're kind of special. Right? It's like, where did that come from? Right? So that transition and making it plausible is very, very, very difficult. The other problem is this. Most of the reason why the girl liked you and chase, was chasing you is because you're unavailable. Then you make yourself available in comfort. And if at any point things don't go your way, you no longer have all that power and leverage you had earlier because you've clearly made yourself available. Right? The reason the girl liked you is because she couldn't have you. Right? But as soon as she can have you, where's your power? Where are you going with that? On top of that, it made it really fucking hard to escalate. Imagine that. Hands off the merchandise. Hands off. No, it doesn't work. doesn't work. Hey, let's have sex. Right? Escalation didn't make a lot of sense either. And so you'd see a lot of guys get tons and tons of attraction, but the transition to comfort and closing was very, very difficult. Um, and getting girls to qualify was like the hard part. Right? There was this line, um, it's actually a decent line if used right, which was, um, you're, uh, you're kind of cute, but beauty is common. What do you have going for you besides your looks? That would make me want to get to know you. You guys heard that line before? Right? And that was like the, when, when you did, if you did structure game and that was your thing, when you drop that line, you're literally holding your breath. Because, <laughs> because if you say that line and she starts qualifying herself, you're like, oh, good. This one's going to work. If you say that line, you're like, hey, what do you got going for besides your looks? And she's like, oh, nothing. You're like, fuck my life. What do I do now? Because right? that was like our one go-to line to, to make that transition. Right? Or if, um, if the girl goes, why should I tell you? You're really fucked. Right, because that means you didn't even do enough of the like attraction stuff, and now you have to go back and cycle through it while you've already given away that you're interested in the girl. Oh shit, right? And so, when this worked, when this worked, it was some of the most powerful game you've ever seen, and I, I shit you not on that. Like some of the most powerful game, and it had the capability to get like true tens, like celebrities, shit like that. Right? It had that power. However, it was like walking a tightrope. As soon as you lean too far one way, you're off that tightrope and you are completely fucked. And you have to like, go climb all the way back on and start over. Right? So it's very, very inflexible um, and very, very hard to actually follow through to a, like a conclusion or a result. But it was like the most powerful type of game I've ever seen. Um, what else can I say about this? Um, bah, 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 comfort close. Basically, yeah, so basically this, this linear sequence is very good. The other problem with this is that Guys would get this linear sequence of I have to open, I have to do attraction, I have to do comfort, I have to do close. And they'd have this idea that it's supposed to take like four to seven hours and they have to do all these various routines and stuff. Sometimes they'd walk up to a girl and they'd say, hey, what's up? And the girl would be like, you're hot. And the guy would be like, well, first I need to nag her three times and then I need to like spend 45 minutes talking to her about you know, showing her my photos around the world. And then and only then can I invite her on a day two, right? It's absolutely ridiculous, right? Because the idea was this procedure worked, but it's a long procedure, and a lot of times you don't have to do all of it. Right? So that's another major, major problem with it. Um, so yeah, so the, the transition for attraction to comfort was very, very difficult. Escalation is very, very difficult. And the problem is it takes a fucking long time, and it's not very flexible. However, extremely powerful, extremely good. So yeah, um, pros to it. Absolutely amazing at groups. How many of you guys? I think you're really good at approaching groups. Anybody? One guy in here. If this was like 10 years ago, uh, and this was like a serious room of like pickup guys, so many people are like, yes, me, me, me. Right? Do you know why? Because they did this shit. And it works really well for groups. It works really well for groups. How often when you see a hot girl, is she with a group? Often. Like always. Like fucking 99.9% .9 of the time. Right? So maybe this would be a good thing to like learn and re-implement a little bit. For those group situations? Just a suggestion. Just throwing it out there. Okay? Amazing for groups. Amazing for getting attraction. And actually amazing for getting the girls you're not supposed to get. Right? The girls that are like technically above you. Um, next thing, and this is amazing too, it made games scientific and testable. Because not, not that this is entirely a good thing, but because guys were going up and saying the same things and doing the same things over and over and over again, they actually got a sample size. And they actually got a control group. You could say, hey, this routine works, this routine doesn't work, because I opened 10 times with it, and I opened 10 times with this one, and these are my results. Right? So it actually made it testable, which is really, really useful. And, and here's a general principle on that. If in your game 
you're being proactive, i.e. you're actively doing something to the girl, doing something to the environment, you're the one at cause and making things happen, it's gonna be very easy to tell when you're doing things well. If you're in reaction, if you're just like kind of hoping and waiting for things to happen, it's gonna be very hard to tell, it's very, very, very hard to learn because there's no cause and effect. Does that make sense? If you're not at cause, it's hard to judge the effect. So any kind of game style you wanna learn, you always wanna make sure you're at cause. Make sure you're the one doing things rather than having things done to you. For A, because it's a good game, but also because otherwise you will never learn. It's just, it's, it's almost impossible to sample size. So it made games scientific and testable, taught storytelling, and it made the people doing this interesting. When I was, okay, so when I was doing this can structured game, I would have a notebook in my back pocket at all times. And whenever a comedian said a funny joke that I overheard in a movie or on TV or whatever, I'd write it down. And whenever someone told a good story, I'd like write like a couple bullet points if that was a good story and here was the structure of it and how could I create a story like that, right? And whenever I said something good in an interaction, I remembered it, I would go write it down after, I'd be like after sleeping with a girl, I'd go in the bathroom and write down like the things I said to her, right? So I was, it sounds funny, right? But I was actively working on being a more interesting person. I was actively working on conveying a more interesting life, telling better stories, being funnier, right? In a very structured, very direct way. It was very, very useful in that regard. Next one, great for flipping the script and getting her to chase. And for any of you who have seen some of my more recent material on how to get nines and tens and whatnot, um, you'll know that getting the girl to chase is one of the things that I am absolutely the biggest on in game. Getting the girl to invest, getting the girl to chase. Um, I call it reverse LMR, right? You should get the girl to the bedroom and instead of her being like, no, 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 we can't, you should be like, no, we shouldn't. And she's the one jumping on you. That should be the goal. And this type of game is very, very good for that. In fact, sometimes it's a little too good for that. I'll tell you a, an interesting story of, as I was learning this game. Um, so I'd, I'd been decent with like somewhat attractive girls, but I, I wasn't getting the hottest, hottest girls, right? And then I had one week where I went out, I went out twice in that week both times I went to a bar that was like a pretty high-end bar, like where I was almost intimidated in the bar, and I went and talked to a girl in like an intimidating group who was like the hottest girl in the bar, got her number, had her chasing me, had her like touching me, and then I had her come out for me on a, on a day two, right? Within like two times going out, hottest girl in the bar, twice picking her up, twice getting her on a day two. And then on both day twos, um, went on the day two, everything was good, got, her, got back to her place, went to kiss her, and she freaked out because she actually had thought I was gay the entire time. Yeah. Weirdly enough, right? Because what had happened was I had learned to be interesting, I'd learned to be non-threatening, I'd learned to be very unavailable and trigger all those kind of like, I can't have it so I want it emotions. But I had done it so convincingly and so well, and I, and I hadn't like conveyed intent in other ways that both those girls actually like thought I was gay, right? Now eventually I did learn to do get those really hot girls without being gay at the same time, right? I learned, I learned how to get through that transition. But it was very interesting that that transition occurred between like getting average girls, getting the hot girls thinking I'm gay, and then getting the hot girls not thinking I'm gay. Um, because it, it is a very backwards getting them to chase kind of a game. And for a girl that's really hot, like how many guys ever do that to her? Pretty much gay guys. Gay guys and like guys that are out of her league, like a true celebrity, basically. Um, anyway, not, not, that's, not, that's not a knock on the style of game, by the way, because my first, the majority of my first six delays also came from that style of game, so you definitely can convey some non-gay things as well. Um, but it's just an interesting story. Um, so it works very well on the hottest girls, works on getting them, to, getting them to chase. And then the last thing, and this is maybe one of the most important things in my game that nobody else does, or nobody does these days, is the idea that I call plotline, okay? Now plotline basically means that there's a dynamic, there's an underlying story between you and the girl, okay? So for this, think of a romantic comedy. Right? And I'm sure like, all of you are thinking of different romantic comedies right now, or, or many, many different romantic comedies. But probably this is true for all of them. At some point, a, a guy and a girl meet. And at some point, there's some tension between them. Excuse me. They don't get along. Maybe they're adversaries. Maybe there's some circumstance between them. Maybe their friends don't like each other. Maybe they're competing in something, whatever. Right? They don't get along at first. And there's more and more heightened emotion between them in this negative sense. And then at some point, Something happens where one of them kind of realizes, oh, the other one's okay, or they're thrust into a situation where they're forced to get to know each other a little bit, and they realize they're okay, and then all that negative emotion gets transferred to positive emotion, and it's like really amazing, and they live happily ever after. Does that sound like every romantic comedy you've ever seen in your entire life? There's a reason for that, because that's the formula of a girl like falling in love with a guy, basically. That's the formula, right? The formula is a lot of emotion 
and then it becomes positive. But it's a lot easier to trigger strong negative emotions than it is to trigger strong positive emotions. Right? So you, what you want to create is that tension. Right? The reason most guys suck with girls and suck at game and end up in a half hour conversation in nowhere is as soon as there's any tension in the relationship, the guy shies away from it. Right? I had a student um, this past weekend, and he was a really cool social guy, like really pretty successful at life, good looking, could open like a motherfucker. Like he was really good at opening conversations. Um, but every time I'd wing with him, the conversation would go absolutely nowhere. Because what would happen is I'd introduce some of this plot line and some of this tension and get the girl kind of like, you know, teasing and going back and forth. And then he'd immediately throw in like a bunch of small talk and like chit chat and just like squash all the tension. And then you know, a few minutes later, I'd introduce some more tension, and then he'd squash it. I'd, tense it I'd, I'd introduce it, he'd squash it. It would never go anywhere. Reason was, that tension is risky. That tension could get you a rejection. So most guys shy away from it. What you want to do is go into that tension. You want to create that tension. Right? Um, so anyway, that's the start of plotline. The idea of plotline is that you have that tension that's created between the two of you, and then there's a resolution. Tension and resolution with a story behind it with a story she can buy into that, that makes her like want to, want to be with you, basically. Think to yourself, if, like, whenever you're talking to a girl, think to yourself, if after this interaction she were to go talk to her friends and tell them about this interaction, what would she tell them? Would she be like, hey, here's a guy who like, wanted to fuck me and I let him fuck me? That's not a story she wants to tell her friends. But if on the other hand you'd be like, hey, you know what, me and this guy, we, we were talking and it was like, like at first there was this tension and I didn't even know if I liked him and I, I, he definitely didn't like me. But then actually we got to know each other and it was really good and then we like spent this magical time and we had so much in common and then like sex. And it was beautiful and it just happened. Right? That's what you want her to tell her friends. Right? And that's what she wants to tell her friends. And that's plot line. Right? That's one plot line. There are a lot of other plot lines you could have, um, but that's, that's a very common one. Right? But this idea that there's a, an underlying story between you and the girl is so, 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 so useful in game. Right? The other thing that Plotline will do is this. How many of you guys have been talking to a girl, you're talking about a particular topic, and then at the end of that topic, you're like, shit, we have nothing to talk about. And then you bring up another topic. You talk a little bit about you know, that thing. And then you're like, oh shit, the conversation is dead. And you have to do something else. You have to keep starting, restarting and restarting the conversation. Does it ever feel like that in game? Right? If you have a Plotline, that doesn't happen. Because you have those topics going on, and then you have this plot line underneath. So you always have a topic to go back to. You always have something to say, and it's productive and moves the interaction forward. Okay? So plot line is one of the most brilliant ideas of game, and that is it's something that came out um, with the structured can game. Okay, cons, I talked about some of these. Hard to escalate and hard to close. Very hard to close. Um, hard, hard to recover from a loss of attention. Because think of it this way all you're doing is being non needy and dismissive. Oh, I don't want you. I'm dismissive, dismissive. And like even your opener, it's almost accidental. It's like, hey, I need your opinion on something. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, I'm here, so I may as well talk. Right? Now, since everything you're doing is dismissive and I don't care and I don't need you, let's say she gets distracted and pulled to the next room by her friends. Now you have to go into the next room and go find her and be like, yeah, I'm not, not that interested in you. I don't need to talk to you. <laughs> but I followed you all the way over here and I wanted to start the conversation again. Right? It's very incongruent. So if you ever like, lose the momentum or lose the frame, it's very hard to get it back. <clears throat> Um, next one is that people became too reliant on their routines. You guys ever heard that I run out of things to say? People say that nowadays. People really said that with routines. Actually, like I have my three routines, and now nothing. Because before routines, I never had a conversation with a human being before in my life. Right? So that definitely happened. There was no improvis improvisational skill. Um, another thing was that you're not, when you're just blindly saying things at the girl, you're not paying any attention to the girl. So that could be a problem sometimes. And then lots and lots of flaking because the amount of attraction was so high that afterwards the girls would feel weird about it. Which, by the way, is not a knock on the style of game at all. It's actually a, it's actually a positive on the style of game, but understand that that, that was the case. Okay? All right. Um, so that brings us to direct game, natural game, et cetera, which is, all, for the most part, there's, there's variation, but for the most part, what gets taught um, by most people teaching pickup nowadays. Um, the interesting thing with this is that if you look at it, do you guys remember the attractive man qualities where I talked about attractiveness, assertiveness, assuredness, attentiveness, aliveness? Essentially, direct and natural game is based on the premise that you have these qualities, and then you're just going to kind of like go put yourself in front of the girl and, and ask her to see them. Right? You're just, hey, I thought, hey, I thought you were cute. Hey, I liked you. And I expect you instantly to see that I have all these qualities. Right? And that instantly thing is problematic. The problem with instantly is problematic is because they're looking at you and they don't have enough to go on. 
right? They, they haven't seen you do enough assertive things and attentive things and attractive things and, and those kind of things yet. Um, and so you'll get a lot of very quick rejections, right? I've, one of the things I've, I've seen in the last month, more than I've ever seen before that really, really annoys the shit out of me, is everybody saying, it's just a numbers game. It's just a numbers game. It's just a numbers game. Everybody's fucking saying that. It's fucking ridiculous, right? The point of game, the point of learning game is to make it not a numbers game, right? Anybody on the planet can have a numbers game. Anybody on the planet can be like, hi, do you like me? No. Hi, do you like me? No. Hi, do you like me? Like, anybody can do that. But the point of game is to, to be able to convey your personality enough that by the time you've asked, do you like me, the answer is more likely going to be yes. Right? So that's the idea there. Um, well, let's go into the, um, the pros and cons. So pros of direct and natural game, and there definitely are some pros. First one, made escalation a lot easier. Okay? If you've already said, I like you, I'm interested in you, I'm attracted to you, now escalation makes sense. Right? If, if you were like, hey, hands off, hands off, and then you touch the girl, she's like, why are you touching me? If you already said, hey, you're, you're cute, I like you, it makes sense to get physical, it makes sense to, um, makes sense to take a girl on an instant date. All the escalation makes sense. And since most guys fuck up at escalation, making the escalation easier is a very positive thing. Right? It makes it more congruent. It does force you to improvise. So it does force you to, as you get good at it, to, to get rid of the idea of I ran out of things to say because you think that you can come up with your own. Um, so that's, that's very good. And it, encourage, it does encourage calibration because, again, every single set is different. And so you understand that every single set's a little different. And you understand that you do have to adjust to the set. So those are definite pros. And they're definitely very huge pros. In essence, if I was to compare the results of the current like natural game style of game versus the old school like structured style of game, here's what I would say. I'd say doing the natural style of game, you will get laid more frequently, but you will get laid with lower quality girls, right? Because you'll be able, you'll be able to escalate. Um, and by more, more frequently, by the way, I don't mean a higher percentage of sets either. So you won't get laid a higher percentage of sets, but you're doing more sets. You're putting yourself out there faster. So you'll just get to the point and get more lays, right? But you're going to get laid with the girls that immediately liked you in the first like 30 seconds or a minute rather than the girls who you got to like you or the girls that like were a little out of your league, that sort of thing. With the old school like structured game, you're going to get probably laid a higher percentage of sets, but your sets are going to be much longer and more drawn out. Um, you're going to get a higher caliber of girl, but you're going to um, like have a lot of ones that get attracted to you, and then you fuck it up later. It's going to be very frustrating in that way. Right? And the, the escalation part is going to be very, very difficult. All right, so those are the kind of the pros and cons of both. So what? I sort of think of in game, and what I'm looking for personally in game is what I consider the holy grail, which is the combination of the two. To have the positives of the structured game and the positives of the natural game. Right? And I think that's, that's what game should be and needs to be going forward. Right? Um, so yeah, looking, looking at the cons of the natural style game, it loses a lot of the good elements of structured game. For example, very bad for groups. Right? Why is it that nobody in here likes, well, one person in here says they're good at opening groups. right? Um, worse for hotter girls, right? Harder to get the nines and tens because you're asking them to evaluate you way too early and way too quickly in the interaction. Typically it leaves the guy chasing. Here's an interesting question. Those of you who have gotten laid doing the natural style game, which I assume most people in here do something like a natural style game, mostly. Yeah? Those of you who have gotten laid doing the natural style game, when you do sleep with a girl, does it feel like you're still chasing most of the way? Does that happen a lot? We're like, you're the one escalating her. She's the one like, no, 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 we can't. Or she's the one giving objections to going to your place, all that kind of stuff. She's the one flaking on the dates. The girl, the girl definitely is not the one chasing, typically, with that kind of thing. No, no plot line is huge as well, right? The interactions either flat, meaning no intent, right? Which means half our conversation to nowhere. Or it's very obvious. Hey, I thought you were cute. I wanted to talk to you. Well, there's not a whole lot of suspense over the fact that you want to fuck her at that point, right? And so for that reason, there's not a lot of like, it just happened. There's not a lot of, she'll tell her friends, oh, I met this guy, and positive things, et cetera. Um, so you lose the plot line. Um, very hard to measure and improve. Because ev if every single interaction is extremely different, how do you compare and know if you're getting better? Right? It's very hard. Um, so basically, the, the end result, and this is what I see tons of in the pickup community, is you'll get the girls that, you're, that are your level or slightly below a lot. Like I see a lot of guys running up lay counts. But I see you guys running up lay counts of like sixes and sevens, right? Um, so you get a lot of the girls that you're supposed to get or the girls you deserve to get or that are a little below you. And you'll be able to escalate on them because the escalation is very congruent. But 
you won't be able to get the girl that's out of your league, right? And everybody says, like, how do you get the 10? Like, you have to become the 10. No, you don't. You don't. You just have to convince her you're the 10, right? She just has to be convinced you're the 10. You don't have to actually become it. Now, if you are it, it helps, of course, but it's not completely necessary. You should be able, the point of game is to get girls that you're not supposed to get, okay? Um, so that's, those are the cons, and that's why um, you want that, the best of both. So what would the best of both look like? It would look like, first of all, high opening consistency um, and immediate emotional relevance, okay? Because um, here's the thing. So let's talk about a little bit about direct versus indirect game. What's better, direct or indirect? Depends. 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 Answer to everything in game depends. What, what's, what's good about direct game? Somebody said cuts to the chase, yeah. and a bunch of people said quiet things. More assertiveness, guys. No, what, what's good about direct game? It's shorter. It's, it's shorter? Okay, it gets to the point. You, you do get laid faster. Yeah, you will get, you will get more five-minute lays with direct game than with indirect. That's true. Because a lot of times with indirect, you haven't even let her know you like her within five minutes. So yeah, for sure. Um, so it's more to the point. What else? Shows that you're uh, more ballsy. Shows you're more ballsy, which can be good. Can be good for the most part, um, at least up to a certain level. Okay. Um, how about it makes it easy to escalate, right? How about it introduces like sex and man to woman topics into the conversation right from the get go, right? Those are the major positives of direct game. Because if you go in and you open direct, the interaction is going to be direct. It's going to be man to woman. There's going to be that sexual charged emotional nature more easily, right? What's the downside of going direct? They blow you off more frequently. Exactly, more frequent immediate blow offs, right? It's high risk, high reward, right? When it works, it works really well, but it fails more often. And then indirect is the opposite, right? So you're, you're gonna open more consistently indirect, but once you open, you still have more to do. You still have to bring the directness into the interaction later, all right? So what you'd like is a combination of both. Um, the next thing I would say for best of both is that, so in, in typical structured indirect game back in the day, it was long ass routines. Right, so for example, I, I don't know if I can still repeat exactly my routines from like 12 years ago or whatever, um, but I had them scripted down to the point of when I delivered the story, it was word for word the same every single time, and I interrupted the story with like teases and, and like nags and game moves at the exact same place every single time. Right, it was like, like literally down to the pauses, the interruptions, the intonations, exactly the same delivery every single time, right? Um, like, I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll give you like a kind of a pantomime of the start of one, right? Excuse me, I need your opinion on something. Um, actually, I gotta go in a minute. But anyway, um, so, um, shit, this has been a long time. Um, so um, my, my sister got these dogs, and she wants to name them after like an 80s rock, oh my god, you and I are not gonna get along. After like an 80s rock star pop duo, right? And so at first, like, she was gonna name them like Duran and Duran. But see, stop looking at me like that. That's like the same name for both dogs. Right? So anyway, okay, so literally, it's, it's very structured, very like scripted, and like down to the the um, even the interruptions. However, it is engaging, right? It's fun. It's interesting. It's funny. It's definitely hard not to react to. So it has a lot of, a lot of positives. And that was not like the best rendition. That's a 13 year old memory rendition of something I haven't done in, in over a decade, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, but that's how that's how structured it was. What good game nowadays probably should be is kind of um, what attractive guys do anyway, which is they tell the same stories that have worked again. They tell the same jokes that have worked. They use a lot of the same lines that have worked because it's just easier. It's easier not to reinvent the wheel. But they're using them at the right times. They're using them when it's congruent rather than just when it's forced. Right? And so um, basically, we're going to say, I say measurable, way, measurable by waypoints. Basically, so instead of being like word for word the same every single time, what it should be is like act for act the same, right? Event for event the same, but not word for word. So the same way that I said to you guys, um, the romantic comedy thing, right? I said, oh, you guys have different romantic comedies in your mind, um, but they're all kind of the same plot line, right? So if I were to write a romantic comedy, what I'd probably do is I'd start out with like, here are the, the steps in that plot line, and then I'll write in the gaps. So every romantic comedy is a little different, but they're all gonna hit the same waypoints. Right? So what you want to do is structure the waypoints, but don't structure every single word. Um, the other thing is you need to be able to calibrate to the girl. right? So you can't just be blindly spitting words at her. Um, and here's a big one. 
And then this is actually like, if you're going to write, like of the notes you should write down from this, escalation with disqualification, write this one down, right? Disqualify as you escalate. If you want to escalate smoothly, if you want the girl to be receptive to your advances, is one of the most powerful techniques, right? So have you guys ever heard of the false time constraint? You know what that is, right? You know what that is? That's, hey, I got to go in a minute, but anyway, and then you sit down as you're talking. What you're really doing is you're escalating, sitting down, while disqualifying, hey, I got to go in a minute, right? And because you're disqualifying, you're making the escalation not mean as much, right? Or how about um, one move I like? I'll, I'll take a, grab a girl by like the shirt or the hand. I'll pull her towards me, very sexy. And as I'm pulling her, I'll be like, I fucking hate you, <laughs> right? It's a, a verbal push away while I'm physically pulling her in. What am I doing? I'm disqualifying with I hate you while escalating with the physical, right? Or um, uh, you know, I'll have to get up early in the morning, but I guess I could like um, you could come over for just you know a few minutes, right? What am I doing? Inviting the girl home while I'm disqualifying, right? This is one of the most powerful techniques to actually escalate in a way where the girl's not going to resist it, right? And that's just something that um, that's used a lot in both um, structured and natural game, but it needs to it should be a part of your game. Um, anything else? Yeah. So these are basically the things that should be in that style of game. Okay, um, And the way I want you to think of it is this. I call it the winding forest path. So think of structured game as, as though it was linear. You have like open, hook, emotional connection, physical connection, close, or something similar to that. And it's this long, drawn out line. And you think that you started at this side of the line, and you have to go the entire length of the line to get to the end. right? Instead, what I want you to think of is a long, winding line, where you still are traveling that line, but a lot of times you can take shortcuts. So it's like this. Right? So you have this long winding line, but say you get to here and you can skip over, that's ideal. So say you walk up and start talking to a girl and you have this plan of opening, hooking, emotional connection, all that kind of stuff. You walk up and she's immediately like, you're, you're really hot. Well, you're not going to go through this massive disqualification process. It's a massive qualification process. You'd be like, oh, you're not so bad yourself. <laughs> and you're going to just cut out all the bullshit in between. OK? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Right? So you, you, you set out with this map, and you know the long winding path, but you're looking for every place that you can cut off that path or every place you can be more efficient. Right? And so in essence, the structure of game, the, like, the pre-scripted, pre-canned, all that kind of stuff, it's there. And it's actually it's, it's a game plan in the back of your head, but it's a game plan you hope to never use. Does that make sense? Right? Even when I was doing the most structured canned game, my best interactions were the ones where I would do like, 20 seconds of the scripted stuff, and then she'd respond well, and I'd just drop it. Right? I'd drop it and, again, cut way ahead. Or I wouldn't necessarily drop it, but I'd drop like the next 10 minutes and cut into something that usually would have come half an hour later or an hour later. Does that make sense? Um, and so this is kind of how I want you guys to think of game. This is like the combination of that structure where you have a game plan, but the flexibility where you're not rigid to your game plan. So I'm going to assume there's going to be a lot of questions on all that, because I just dumped a, just a shit ton of material on you guys. Um, yeah, I'll take, yeah. Uh, yeah, all right. So my question is, uh, how would you get better with storytelling? How would you build something with storytelling? Um, tell lots of stories. Uh. Right, practice makes anything better. Tell lots of stories. Um, watch good storytellers. Watch good stand-up comedians. Um, when someone else tells a good story, make notes of it. Um, any good story, um, this is like from the scripted can days, but any good story is a set of bullet points. Right? Like think, of, think of if you were to tell a joke. In order for a joke to work, you have to hit certain criteria. Otherwise, the punchline won't make sense. Right? Now, not every story has a punchline, but every story has certain elements to make it work. Right? And so you need to think of this story in terms of at least its skeleton. Right? Think, what are the elements that make this story work? And if it's a good story, how can I make other stories like it? Right? So become kind of a student of stories. Um, also, work on, this isn't a direct answer to your question, but it kind of is. Work on your delivery as well as the story itself. Right? Um, there's a, um, take the phrase, um, I didn't say she stole the cookies. You should be able to say that like 20 different ways with 20 different meanings. Does that make sense? <laughs> Depending what word you emphasize. So instead of like, I didn't say she stole the cookies, or I didn't say she stole the cookies. I didn't say she stole the cookies. I didn't say she stole the cookies. Right? You see, every little difference, it changes the meaning. Right? And you get, you get much more leverage and much more use out of your delivery as well. Um, so even a bad story delivered well can actually become, to a certain extent, a good story. Um, 
Not off the top of my head. Um, the Making People Talk book is just good for general conversation. What I'd recommend more than books is watch good stand-up comedy. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. So when you talked about the, you know, the better looking girls being in the groups, you know, that really hit home, and I'm kind of still in purgatory, seven purgatory right now. The one reason I stopped doing groups is because Hickam has kind of gone mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so even the token guy that's in a group kind of knows when, like when you roll up, mm -hmm. kind of has an idea. He's heard about the game, he's done that. And I've been called out many times in a set, usually with the most beautiful girls, where there's mm -hmm. like the token guy. <clears throat> I've had him be like, oh, he just did a neg or something along those, you know, <laughs> traditional kind of like things. Mm -hmm. And they end up kind of blowing me out. So that's one of the reasons I stopped doing this mm -hmm. pretty much all together, because mm -hmm. there was the, there's always someone there who's going to kind of throw in a, a monkey wrench, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So how can I approach the group in this kind of hybrid theory, so to mm -hmm. speak, and not give away my agenda? Right, OK. So there's a number of different things there. Um, I should actually, do you guys want to like quick, quick scenario, synopsis in like group theory and stuff? Yeah. You guys want that? Yes? OK, we'll do that. We'll do a little group theory. Um, and then we'll get to, we'll get to that as, as part of it as well. So the idea, of, the idea of group theory isn't that like, you're going to do like, one specific type of approach or, one, or that you have to do like, a neg in the first 10 seconds or something like that. Um, the idea of group theory, basically, there's, there's some tenets. First one is you have to engage everyone to a certain extent. right? And that can be done in a positive or negative way, but it needs to be done. Um, but there's different ways. So say you see a group of people. right? There's really two ways to engage the group. One is to go in and engage the whole group at once. The other is to engage one or two people in the group and then use them immediately as a catalyst to engage the rest of the group. Right? And either one is a valid, valid form of group theory. Um, so one answer to what you just said is don't engage the part of the group that has the guy in it initially. Right? So you can always get to him very quickly, but he doesn't have to be part of it. So say, for example, you have a group of like five people, two girls here, and then there's a guy and like maybe guy girl over here. If the girl that you want is in, in that two, a lot of times you could open the two, throw a little like you know, teasing something there, or get a little engagement there. And then as soon as you have that leverage, as soon as you're in the door a little bit, then they, oh, you guys, yeah, wait, wait, you're trouble. But anyway, how do you guys all know each other? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then you get all the introductions and such. And that way, um, the dude isn't privy to like, the approach itself. It looks more accidental to him. Um, and he's not involved at the moment where he has leverage and you don't. Because here's the thing with, with a group of guys. right? With a group of guys, they were there first, right? And you just came up and did a cold approach. So if they have a problem with you, even if they're in the wrong, they're in the right, as far as the group goes, because they have history, right? Um, and so with a situation like that where you think there might be a strong objection, um, you almost want to open accidentally, right? So I actually have a couple of a set of openers that I call like accidental openers, right? One that I'll do sometimes is I'll actually like kind of like back into the group by accident. Like, oh shit, oh sorry about that. Hey, you know what, you guys are actually kind of, you guys seem cool, hi, nice to meet you, as long as I'm here, right? <laughs> because think about that, right? If you walk up to the group with a guy in it, and the guy is, you know, has an objection to you, the girls don't know you yet, and just to appease their friend, unless they like, just are overwhelmed with attraction for you, they're going to probably take his side, right? And it's kind of a bad strategy for him long term, because if he's always the fun hater, eventually they'll dislike him, but that doesn't help you much right now. Does that make sense? Um, but if it seems accidental, or at least like there's not an agenda there, and he objects, now he's fucking weird. And now he's the asshole fun hater. Right? So you want to create a situation where if he's objecting, he's the asshole fun hater. Right? Um, and um, a opinion opener can work somewhat for that sort of thing. But like, the things that are even more accidental than that can work as well. Right? And I actually, with a set that is clearly a guy and a girl kind of together, or where I think the guy's going to be antagonistic, I'll try and even make it accidental, as opposed to even like an opinion or even indirect. Right? So that, that's the thing that'll work there. The other thing I'll do is I will choose which part of the group to open to not open the guy first. And then that way, once I'm getting introduced to the guy, which can still be in the first like 10 seconds, but at that point, um, I at least have a little bit of leverage from the girls, and I'm being introduced by them so that he can't really object. Right? She's like, hey, meet Todd. Then the guy can't be like, what an asshole. Like, you don't, first of all, you're being introduced by a friend. And second of all, there's no, no cause for you to say that. Right? So that's, that's something I would do in, in that case. So um, watching your immediate logistics. 
um, is useful, and watching your timing is very, very useful. Um, the other really, this is a very old school group tactic type of thing, is important question is how do you guys all know each other? Right? How do you guys all know each other? And you have to ask that to someone who likes you. If you ask the dude in the group, how do you all know each other? They'll be like, I fucked all these hoes. <laughs> right? Um, but if you ask the girl, be like, oh yeah, no, we're just friends from school. This guy's, you know, he's obnoxious. Whatever. And then, and then you're okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of finessing you can do to stop from getting that reaction. If you do get that overtly negative reaction, <clears throat> what you should do probably is be fairly like innocent and kind of just like the fun, happy guy. Right? Whoa, easy there, killer. Hi, I didn't catch your name. What was it? Right? And just be the fun, happy, whatever guy. Yeah, so we have, we have this guy who likes to you know, give everybody shit. And then we have you, your, your trouble. What's your name? Right? And just be conversational and fun, but more, more chatty, more conversational, more assertive. Right? There's a great, um, it's actually an old school mystery line um, for, for opening a group where he said, the frame that you want, it's not sexual, it's chatty. Right? Now, you want, we want to get sexual eventually with the girl. Right? But the initial frame you want is chatty. You want to be like a little chatterbox. Even, again, I told you the story of like when I was doing group theory and very, very good at it, and, but hadn't made the transition. A couple times I pulled the hottest girl, got dates with the hottest girl, but then she thought I was gay. Acting a little gay in the first 30 seconds is not the worst thing in the world. Right? It's not actually the worst thing in the world, because it's like incredibly fun, incredibly non-threatening, and incredibly happy. Right? You can always show that intent later one-on-one. -on -one. So there's a lot of things like that you can do in terms of adjusting the vibe, adjusting the, the energy. And <clears throat> um, just because the guy goes, that was an egg. Like, if you get defensive, like, no, I didn't egg you. Now you, you're, you're called out, right? But Does it make sense, sorry, does it make sense to kind of uh, be above his frame? So if he calls out an egg, kind of be overbearing on his frame to kind of, do you know what I mean, kind of override his reaction? Yeah, yeah, I think so. You have to keep it fun, though. So I would be more likely to go over the top with fun and energy than to go over the top with negativity. Does that make sense? Um, one of the best, um, one of the best, this is a little off topic, but one of the best AMOGs I've seen in a really, really long time. I was, at, um, I was at a club in Los Angeles, and the guy I know who's a friend of a friend of a friend who does pickup, um, basically there was a guy that came up um, and was like trying to like act like, like name drop and act like he was like someone important and get in the guy's set. And then the guy just goes, Security! Mr. Hermanson's being an asshole again! Right over here, guys! We got a tough guy! <laughs> and the guy's like, uh, okay, bye. <laughs> it's fucking amazing, right? But he actually delivered like, even better than me. Like, it's just like, because I was kind of like a little antagonistic. He was just super like happy and fun and whatever. Just like, hey, we got a tough guy right here, tough guy. <laughs> and the guy's like, oh fuck, everybody in the club's looking at me. Back down. Um, so in that case, he's definitely out alphaing the guy, but it's fun. It's fun, it's funny, it's amusing, and everybody around it, like, sees it and likes it. Right? And that's what you want to be. You want to be kind of the, um, the bully who you can't dislike. Does that make sense? Because you're not even bullying. You're just, like, you're, you're just coming over the top with more fun and more positivity. So the point that if anybody hates you, they truly do hate fun. That kind of makes sense? Yeah. Um, I think that, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. So uh, first, I want to say I, I love your game. Like, Thank you. Know, you. Help me with my virginity, essentially. So. Awesome. Yeah. Good job. Uh, so essentially, what I started doing is a lot of direct game. Like I went up, like, oh, I think you're cute, blah, and that got me like the first couple of girls mm -hmm. in Europe. And when I moved here, I started doing a lot of indirect game, but I started sexualizing the conversation from the beginning, like extreme. So mm -hmm. what I'm doing now is I'm basically like, oh, hey, what's your name, blah, blah. Oh, by the way, you're my next sister. You're my next wing woman. Mm -hmm. Let's both get laid tonight. Which group okay. here do you want from me? I'll pick you a guy. Okay. I'll make it very sexual from the beginning. Okay. Would you say that is like a route you would take? Like very indirect game. I'm not telling her I want her, mm -hmm. but I'm making it extremely sexual. Like we're talking about threesomes. We're cool. talking about uh, she, she fucked her friend. Cool. The so the best answer I can give you is: Is it working for you? then I would say keep doing it. You know what I mean? Sure. Is it working out for you? All right, stick with it. Um, generally, I like it. Um, be care the one thing I'll say with it is this. Um, this graph right here. Be careful that you don't get so caught up in that frame that you miss an easy shortcut. Okay. Right? So don't be, if you're getting so into like, oh, I'm going to set up with this girl, and you're going to set up with that guy, and we're going to enact this frame, and instead the girl's just into you, just cut through the fucking trees and like get to that later part in the game. Don't be so caught up in it. Does that make sense? Because it's, nice it's a nice little fun gambit. It's a nice little um, way to 
keep things like a little bit, I'm not interested, but I am interested in a good way to in introduce the sexuality. But the problem with it is it is very indirect, and it could, um, there, the, it introduces a lot of chaos into the set, like introduce a lot of other variables and random factors and stuff. Um, like for example, if you get the girl intr introducing herself or getting introduced to other guys, a lot of times the guy who didn't do the approach but got into the conversation will suddenly be super confident and he'll be completely non-needy because he didn't approach. And so he's gonna have this weird advantage over you in a weird way, right? And so that can fuck you up sometimes. There's just various sort of random factors that you're introducing we don't have to. So it's cool, it's fun, I like it. To, to an extent, but just be careful about making things more complicated than they have to and getting too far away from directly going for what you want. Does that make sense? Yeah? You talked a bit about, uh, about bot labs. I've never actually tried to work that into my game consciously, mm -hmm. but it sounds like a really cool Sure, yeah. Um, so I guess the best way to do it is to explain a couple plot lines I use. I'll, I'll tell you two plot lines that I use often. Okay. Um, the plot line that I'll use with a girl who's like very cute but not like stunning, stunning hot, or a girl who is stunning hot but just seems to like me very very early on, like seems to have some level of attraction or some level of banter with me, like she's not being cold. Right? I wouldn't do this with a girl being cold. But with a girl that either seems attractive or for a girl that's just cute but not like like up there or out, out of my league kind of, um, what I would do is this whole like frame of, will you please stop being so cute? I'm trying not to like you. Like I'm, I'm like, look, just, I'm fucking, I'm so attracted. Oh my God, look, I'm like, I'm holding your hand now. This is weird. Like, we have to stop, right? So I'd actually overtly escalate and overtly show that I'm very attracted. And I would even take this, this role of like, I'm this incorrigible sex addict almost, right? That like can't help himself, but I'm trying really hard. And so the tension comes from the fact that I'm trying to resist, but there's that clear intent, right? So it's not completely direct. Contrast that to the guy that's just like, hey, you're cute. I wanted to meet you. So tell me all about you and I'll try and impress you, right? That's much less fun, much less interesting, much more boring, and there's no tension. Right? right, that's the second one, right? So the, the, that's the first one. I call that one sweetie game um, or sex addict game, right? And that, that's a plot line that I will use um, when, it, when it's going well and I want to sexualize and really ramp things up um, with a girl that seems to like me or a girl that I'm, I'm pretty confident will like me. Um, with a girl that's a bit harder to get, I'll do more of that romantic comedy sort of um, plot line, which is... I'm not so I'm, you know I'm not so into you or there's something weird about you or I'm not you know you and I aren't going to get along some kind of push away I'll push her away first right and I'm either pushing her away this actually works better in a group because then I can have the group liking me and the group reacting to the fact I'm pushing her away but it also works one on one as well especially cuz hot girls aren't used to being pushed away so what I'll do is I'll push her away to the point where I can where I sense she doesn't want to be pushed away anymore or the, the point where I sense she wants a little bit of attention from me and then I'll give it to her, but I'll make her work for it. And so I've established a, sort of a, a setup where she's trying to impress me to get my attention, or trying to compliment me to get my attention, or hanging out around me to get my attention, or I, pull, I turn away and she pulls me back. Right? So I'm setting up a frame where she's chasing. Right? And, and the idea here is that I'm interested in her in a way. Like she's in the right category that I would normally want to have sex with, but there's just something about her that I'm not feeling. Right? And she's like, but I'll get this one. Does that make sense? Right? Um, so that's another plot line I'll use a lot. Um, there are a lot of other little plot lines I can do. Here's another, another fun plot line, actually, um, if you want to play with it, is go up to a girl and just from moment one act like she's your ex-girlfriend. Just go like, oh my god, what are you doing here? It's been so fucking long and I see you here, like of all places. Right? And just fully act like she is your ex-girlfriend. And then she's like, do I know you? Be like, oh god, look, I know it ended badly, but you don't have to go that far. Like, come on, chill out. Like, we can, we can at least be friends here. Right? And just fully play it, like congruently play it. And again, what does that do? It introduces sexuality, introduces like tension, it makes it much more interesting. There's, there's that clear barrier, there's that clear, we've had sex before, right? So there's that clear sexuality, there's that clear barrier of no, 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 I don't wanna get, like it ended badly, like I'm, you, you even look better than last time I saw you, but like it ended badly last time, I just can't get my heart hurt, you know, again, I can't do it. So there's that inherent tension, inherent plot line. So that's another example, right? So rather than like try and give you like, the definition of plotline, I think like just illustrating examples is probably like the better way to do it. And there, there's hundreds, hundreds of plotlines you could do, but those are some examples of, of ones I've seen work a lot. Yeah, other questions? Cool, cool, yeah. Um, yeah. For the creating tension, mm -hmm. now when that happens in my set, I also feel the tension. Mm -hmm. I don't do the game probably as often as you do. At this point, are you also feeling the tension? Because I, it, to me, it seems more like you have more power when you're in control and you're 
you're not feeling the tension, but she does. Mm -hmm. Does it ever get to the point where you know you can make yourself not feel the tension, but make her feel the tension, that sexual tension, to to make her you know? Sure. So I'll give you maybe a better. I, I I think I disagree with your end goal a little bit. So your end goal sounds like I want to not feel the tension and have her feel the tension. Exactly. I think your end goal should be, I want to feel the tension, and I want to enjoy every minute of it. Mm -hmm. So rather than the tension being a bad thing, where like you're not enjoying it, like when, when a set's going well and I'm feeling that tension, I get a little bit hard in set. Like I get a little halfy in my pants. <laughs> I, like seriously. Like I know, like I'm sitting here thinking like, fuck, I'm going to get laid tonight, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I feel that tension, and I know it, and I enjoy it. Because like, a lot of guys are they're scared of the tension, but did you know that fear and excitement are essentially the same thing, right? So if you go on a roller coaster, are you scared or are you excited? Both. Right, right. <laughs> now, if you have like a gun to your head, you're probably just scared, right? But depending on the framing of things, depending on the situation, like that fear can be excitement, that fear can be a good thing, right? And so I think the, the, the end goal is to not to not feel it. You want to feel it. You want to feel that tension, but you want to enjoy that tension. It's so as the girls, as a girl, because for the girl, she enjoys it a bit, but it also feels like nervous and a little icky for her at the same time as enjoying it. You just want to be fully enjoying it. Right? And because of that, then you can hold the tension longer and better. Right? But you're also congruent with it. Because if you're too detached from the tension, that banter is going to lose its, it's going to lose its spark. Right? So I think the goal isn't to be completely detached. Like, you want to be more detached than her in a, in, a, in a pure, like, who wants the other person more sense. Absolutely. But I think the, the real goal is to just be comfortable in the tension and not, not have it be a problem for you but to actually live with it. So let's talk about implementation, because probably the biggest thing that I hear from people when I tell them, like, oh, you know, you can do some structured things in game, or you can implement this little piece into your game or whatever, is, like, how do I do it without, like, putting myself in my head? How do I do it without getting worse before I get better, et cetera? So that's, that's one of the big things with, with a structured game. If you try to, do, try to do everything at once, you will get worse before you get better, right? So how should you implement it properly in terms of how do you learn it the best, how do you structure your night, um, all those kind of things. So let's talk about that kind of stuff. Um, so first of all, we have a way called Jerry Seinfeld Method. Anybody ever seen the movie Comedian by, with Jerry Seinfeld? Watch that movie. That's one of those movies. That's a movie that if this was like 10 years ago in game, every single one of you would have watched, right? Because that was like the movie recommended for structured game. Um, but basically, uh, Jerry Seinfeld Comedian is basically Jerry Seinfeld is is creating a new comedy routine. Right? He's been off the road for a while. He's doing his show. And he decides to go create a new comedy routine. He's creating it from scratch. So he's not using any of his old material. He's not using any of those safety nets. He's creating a completely new routine. Um, and so at first, he's not that good. At first, he's like kind of like getting like half-assed reactions. But by the end of it, he's, he's amazing. But his policy and philosophy was this. He would add one or two jokes per night. That's it. So each night, he had the things that had worked before the things that he relied on, the things that were his best game, so to speak, his best comedy game. And he would mostly do that. He'd do like 90 95% just doing his best. And then he'd add one or two new jokes a night. By doing that, a couple different things happen. Number one, he can try out new jokes and see if they're good. Right? Number two, he can try out new timing and new like structuring and, and orders of other jokes. And then number three, it's constantly fresh for him. So every single time he gets on stage, instead of being like, well, I'm going to monotonously, re monotonously repeat this thing that I've said like 20 times before, it's fresh and it's new and there's a challenge. Right? And so it keeps him engaged at the same time. Right? So how does this apply to learning game? Well, if you're doing a more structured type of game, instead of doing the same routines every single time or the same bits every single time or same general outline every single time, add one or two little new things, little new tweaks to it every single time to keep it fresh, to keep it interesting. If you're doing a non-structured style of game, which is also totally fine, then I would say go out and do your non-structured style of game, but have one or two things that you're like, I'm going to try and say a couple push-pull lines tonight. Or I'm going to actively disqualify pulling the girl and see if I can get her to chase tonight. Right? So not a bunch of things. You're not going to try and do 20 things. You're not going to be like, OK, today I'm going to open. Open and direct, I'm going to use this line, this line, and this line. I'm going to make sure that like, I back turn the girl three times. I'm going to make sure I make her pay for my drink. And I'm going to make sure that like, I get an Uber, not a taxi. Right? <laughs> like, that's a lot. Okay? Instead, one or two things. And beyond that, trust yourself. Trust yourself for wherever you are at that moment. Right? And so that's a really good combination of practice plus performance. And that's really important, by the way. Performance in game matters. Right? Everybody tell you, be outcome independent? Fuck that. Be outcome dependent. The guys who say outcome independence, it's bullshit because if you're outcome independent and you go for weeks and months without getting a lay, or you just go and like self-amuse and don't get a result, that's going to hurt your confidence. That's going to hurt your inner frame. 
that's going to hurt your perception of what you're doing in game, right? And so, I mean, in, in a lot of areas, you could take failure, 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 failure along the, road, along the road to learning it, wouldn't matter that much. Like you do a math problem wrong 20 times on the road to getting it right, it doesn't really matter, right? But in game, if you go out 20 nights in a row and just get blown out for 20 nights in a row, that's not just a technical thing, that's affecting you emotionally, right? So the problem when I say fuck outcome independence is you need to have successes along the way. Does that make sense? So you need to have an outcome that you can achieve and you need to have you know, positive feedback along the way. There's a good, um, I actually, to be fair, I haven't read this book, but I've, I've heard it um, summarized. Um, it's called The Winner Effect, right? The idea is basically um, with animals and with people, if you experience winning, your body releases different hormones than if you experience losing. And those hormones encourage you to take more risks and encourage you to do more of the behaviors that are to lead to future winning, right? So along the way to learning game, you don't want to be failing, failing, failing. You want to be succeeding, succeeding, succeeding. And so you want to, A, do your best each and every night. You're like throw in a couple little things, but do your best mostly. Um, but also beyond that, you want to be setting up metrics where you can win by those metrics. So if you're brand new at game and your metric for success is I have to get laid, you're going to see failure, 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 failure. If we're brand new to game and your metric for success is I want to stay 30 seconds in set, you're going to see some success. And then it's I want to do 30 seconds in set and throw one push pull line, you're going to see some success. Right? And so you need to be outcome dependent. Not outcome dependent for a result or for the girl, but you need to be outcome dependent for something that's a victory and that's progression to you. Because if you're not seeing progress, you'll stop gaming and that winner effect phenomenon is going to work against you. Next thing you want to do in terms of your game, structured backup plan. Okay, you want to have a structured backup plan. Remember this, remember this model. Remember this graph. Super, super important, okay? That's what structured backup plan is. So um, let's take the opener. Opener is a big part of game. So you walk up, and my way of opening, my favorite way to open, is just say whatever comes to my mind, right? However, if I get here and nothing comes to my mind, hey, sorry, um, you looked really interesting. I thought I'd you know, come grace you with my presence, cool. right? Something I've said before. Does that make sense? So I have that on the back burner. So my goal is to never use it. If I'm going to go out in a session, I'd prefer to never say that thing. I'd absolutely prefer to never say that thing. But if I get up there and I'm drawing a blank, I'll say the thing. Okay, so that's the structured backup plan. Or for example, remember that line, um, you have a lot go um, wait, uh, beauty's common, what are you going for you besides your looks? If I'm doing well, I never want to use that line. However, if I absolutely can't grow a girl to qualify any other way, guess what's coming out? That line's coming up, okay? So even my, my suggestion would be, even if you're going to go completely uncanned, if you're going to go completely unstructured, have that backup plan that you have a couple things for every little waypoint, right? Or here's a big one. Say that, for example, um, the girl's, you lose her attention, she gets dragged away by her friends. That's a tough situation. Do you want to have to come up with like a brand new brilliant thing every single time that happens? No. Instead, have a few canned things that you can use if and when that situation arises. So think of it in terms of you see those like little fire things, it's like break glass in case of fire. That's what the routines are. That's what the structure is. Like in case of fire, break glass. Otherwise, just go do your thing. But when you need it, it's good to have it there. When you're flustered and everything hits the fan, it's good to have a backup plan. How do you run your night? A lot of people say this thing about um, you want to go out for like the first you know, hour or two of the night and just like bounce around the club. And you're not going to get a result anyway. Um, and then other people will say, like, you want to go hard from the first set. Um, so the question is this. When should you stay in an interaction and when should you leave? How do you know? And here's the model I have in my head. Um, it's an idea from poker. It's called expected value. Right? And in order to do this, uh, it's a little mental exercise for you guys. Um, I'll ask you, what is your expected value for a night? Or your expected value for like a day game session or whatever? Right? So on average, if you go out to a club or you go out in the daytime, how many numbers are you going to get? Um, what, what quality of a girl are you going to pull on average and with what percentage chance? Right? What is your average result? Ask yourself that. Okay? And that's going to be different for everybody in this room. Then, as you're talking to a girl, I want you to ask yourself, is my average result from talking to this girl higher or lower than my average result in the night? That's it. That's the criteria for if I stay or if I leave. So, for example, for me, um, the, my, my expected value model in my head is, um, if I'm gaming and going hard and, and like trying to get a result, I would say I have like about an 80, 85% chance of pulling a girl who's like an eight or better, right? 
which, you know, not like, not a, you know, Victoria's Secret model every night, but like a girl that if you saw her in a magazine, you wouldn't be like, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> right? Um, so <clears throat> pretty good chance of pulling a pretty hard girl. That's if I'm, I'm going hard, I'm going for a result, and I have like proper like situation for me, okay? Now, <clears throat> given that, if I'm talking to a girl who's like a seven and she's giving me some shit, do I feel really inclined to stay and like try and like grind it out and like turn her around and make her like me? No. If I see a girl who's like my personal 10 and she's giving me some shit, do I feel inclined to grind it out and turn around and make her like me? Absolutely yes. If I see a girl who, if I'm with a girl who's an eight and it seems to be pretty on, am I pretty inclined to stay there? Absolutely. Does that make sense? So I'm looking at my expected value for the night, my expected value in the set, and that's what's gonna make that decision for me, right? And that's what's gonna create the game plan. <clears throat> um, and then we'll get to this a little bit later, so we're talking about developing your own style. That's gonna be the kind of last slide, and that's gonna be kind of, I'll talk to you guys a lot about that. <clears throat> But um, your expected value is also going to come down to what style of game you're doing, right? Are you doing shotgun game where you're just going to go up to, hey, do you like me? No. Hey, do you like me? No. Hey, do you like me? Yes. Let's go home. That's going to have one expected value, whereas another type of game is where you're trying to finesse it and get like maybe the hottest girl or like turn around the ones that don't like you. So that's going to change things too, depending what style you're doing. But essentially, that's the idea of how long you should stay and how you should structure your night is that expected value model. Okay? Does that make sense? So what do we have so far? So when you go out. Mostly you want to be doing your best, right? Most nights you want to be doing your best. However, you want to throw in one or two different things. And then in any given set, in, any, in the night, you're thinking expected value model. What's my expected value from the set? What's my expected value from the night? <clears throat> one last tweak on the expected value model is that as the night gets long, later, or as you have less time left in your day game session, your expected value goes down, right? Because you have less time to get a hot girl. So if my expected value was 85% get an eight or whatever, um, then like, if it's gotten to the last hour of the night and I havenven't taken a girl home, maybe like you know a seven and a half starting to look pretty good, right? <laughs> or um, maybe an eight that's giving me a little more shit. I'm more willing to grind it out and stick stick in there rather than like leave and go find greener pastures. Does that make sense? Because the expected value outside of that set has gone down, so that that factors in as well. But that's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, and the great thing here is that it's not it doesn't allow for a lot of excuses. And it doesn't allow for a lot of you getting in your own way. Doesn't allow for that mental masturbation of oh she's not, not hot enough I don't think or or oh um, you know I, I'm just not not feeling it or I'm out of state or whatever. It's just simply like is this good, is this good? This is where I stay. And then once you made the decision to do it, you just fucking do your best. No excuses, right? There's no excuses. Do your best because you've you've chosen. You've chosen. This is the right decision. So there's no choice from there. Just do your best in that decision. Next idea of why I suggest having some structured things as backup is what I call freeing up mental RAM. Right? If you have to spend all your time and energy coming up with exactly what you want to say all the time, that's really tough. That's really tough. That's very engaging. If you have things you've said before that you can throw in here and there, it allows you to say the thing and kind of on autopilot and in the back of your head be thinking where you're at. Right? Um, it's something as well, like something I learned kind of from public speaking as well. Is like if you give, like I've done speaking tours where I give the same speech in various cities, like to the point where by the, by the last city on the tour, I know all the punchlines, right? Because I've said it. And funny enough, like on, well, you have to be careful of it getting stale at that point. But the great thing is that it allows you to like look at the audience and see the reactions and add new things and nuances into the speech because you don't have to worry about what you're going to say next. You can kind of let that run on autopilot. So it would be pretty good. And then what you want to be doing is focusing on her. right? And again, what's the goal in terms of 90-10 uh, rule? Only, one person in it. Only as long as you have to. right? Right? Only as long as you have to. And then the goal is what? 90-10 the other way, if possible. right? You want her buying in. You want her contributing. You want her qualifying, et cetera, et cetera. Get, huh? get her to game you. right? So that's the goal. So in order to get her to game you, you need to be paying attention to her. You need to be seeing. Is she ready to game me? Is she liking this? Is she not liking this? Is this working? What is her blueprint? All those various types of things, right? So once you free up that mental REM, you can pay attention to that. If you're thinking, oh god, what's the next thing I'm going to say? That takes a lot of mental energy. All right, um, one of the actually interesting questions that I get a lot, because my game tends to be very technical, right? So a lot of guys ask me, like, so I, I, I do an infield breakdown. I'm like, I'm thinking this and this and this. People are like, are you really thinking all those things when you're doing the breakdown, like when you're in the set? Yes. And what's yes. the answer? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you've heard the answer before, right? So yeah, yes, I am thinking those things, but I'm not thinking the basics. I'm not thinking how do I escalate because I've escalated so many times. I'm not thinking 
what's the next step between the club and my home because I plan that out before going out so I don't have to make it up on the spot. Right? So I've done a lot of my homework ahead of time so that I have the freedom to be thinking in all those details. Um, so freeing up mental RAM is another thing that you want to be thinking of in terms of all that. Intent versus freedom of outcome. It's like a lot of people have this paradox, right? Showing intent versus being free from outcome. How do you solve that? Because right? if you're free from outcome, then you're non-needy and that's attractive. But if you show intent, you're going to get to the point and you're going to get sexual. You're not going to have the, the half hour conversation in nowhere. Right? So how do, you, how do you kind of work those two together? And the solution is this. First of all, you're never going to be free from outcome. Don't try to be free from outcome. Don't try. Instead, pick a good outcome. Pick an outcome that you're in control of and pick an outcome that she would be OK with. So if your outcome is, I want to have an amazing conversation with you and connect with you, and maybe something will happen, right? That's not an agenda outcome. That's not an outcome that's like needy or weird or whatever. What'd you say when you what? Reset outcome? Oh, when you reach that outcome? Well, then you have a new one, right? So you had that amazing conversation, and then now my outcome is, because it's amazing, I want it to go to a deeper level of amazing, which is me going deep inside of her. Right? Does that make sense? Right? You can, you can, it's, it's kind of like um, if, if you're playing sports, right? Like you may have a goal to like make a certain team, and then once you make that team, you have a goal to win the championship. Once you win the championship, you have a goal to make this other team. Then you, you know, so you're going to progress. As soon as you hit one goal, there's always the next goal, right? But what you want to have each each step along the way is an outcome that you have some control over, so that it's not this needy thing where you're reliant on other people, and one that's that's positive, so you're not at odds with the world, but you're like in in partnership with the world or with the people you're with. Does that make sense? Right, and because those are ones that are going to be um, less opposition. Um, so don't try and be outcome free. Try and pick good outcomes. And then be very intentful for those outcomes. Um, what about self-amusement versus having structure and direction? This is an interesting one, because a lot of people are like, well, if I have like, structure, then it's like so binding, and, and how am I going to be self-amused? Also, um, isn't self-amusement attractive? Right? That's actually an interesting question. Who here thinks that self-amusement is attractive? Well, yeah, kind, of. kind of. It is a little bit. It is a little bit. Here's what's attractive about self-amusement. If I'm willing to be amusing myself, I clearly am not super needy about the reaction. right? So it shows a lack of agenda. If I'm willing to be self-amusing, it shows that at times in the past when I've been a little bit self-amusing, I've probably received a decent response. Does that make sense? So in that sense, it's attractive. However, being too self-amusing, if you're violating social rules, if you're saying awkward things, if you're being self, a lot of people do self-deprecating self-amusing, like they make fun of themselves self-amusing, that's actually conveying a lot of negative things, and that's not going to help you. So self-amusing, per se, isn't attractive. But the, the, the attitude of self-amusement can lead you, on average, to doing more attractive things. Does that kind of make sense? Um, so here's what I think of, though. In terms of like being self-amused while having structure in your game, first of all, if you're bored with telling a story, don't tell it. Right? You don't have to tell a story just because it worked before. You don't have to tell a joke because it worked before. You don't have to use a line because it worked before. Use what you want to use. Right? That said, it doesn't hurt to have those solutions in the can anyway. Right? You can always have them and not use them. That's number one. Um, number two, and this is the, the last two, two and three here, become fascinated by a game and then self-engagement. This is how I have stayed kind of always self-amused in game. Right? I think of myself as a student of the game. I think of myself as like almost like a researcher of game. And like I look at the game itself as beautiful. Like, if I say something to a girl and I watch her reaction, it's a little bit different. That's like a little miracle of nature to me. Right? It's a new like, little revelation. Right? And I'm fascinated by it. I'm truly, truly fascinated by it. Or when I, when I want to go try some new like, line or try some new thing or new idea in game, I can't wait. I can't, I'm like, oh my god, it's like Christmas morning. I get to try this new thing and see the reaction. Because right? I'm actually I'm, I'm fascinated by the girls, but I'm fascinated by the game itself. Right? And because of that, I'm always not self-amused, but self-engaged. Right? I'm always present, and I'm always engaged in what I'm doing. I'm, I'm always focused, and I'm always, you know, I'm always there. Right? Um, and so that, that idea of self-amusement, especially for like, introverted guys, like, self-amusement to me is a little weird. Like, I don't walk around like, ha, 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 ho, oh, yeah. Like, I'm, not, I'm not a big, bouncy, laughy, like, clown, center of attention type of guy naturally. Right? So I'm not naturally like, Mr. Amused anyway. But what I am is I'm very focused and engaged. 
right? In the same way that like, if you're reading a good book, you be very zoned in and very focused, but it's not this like loud, crazy thing. But you're engaged, right? In the same way, if I'm doing, if I'm talking to a girl, I'm just very engaged and very fascinated by her, right? So I say get rid of the word self amusement. Think in terms of self engagement. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Now this is probably the, the the next couple slides are probably the biggest um, thing in terms of merging the two styles of game. How many people here have either watched or done improvisational comedy? A couple people. OK, watched it. How many people have done it? A couple? OK, cool. I highly recommend it. Like, of all the things you can do outside of game to make your game better, improvisational comedy is probably the single best one you can do. OK? Um, but so what you want to look at in terms of game in the structure, don't think of it in terms of, remember I, I did this thing where I did, gave you my kind of my pickup routine from 13 years ago? And it's like word for word, interruption for interruption. Don't think that way. Instead, think about waypoints. Think about um, different things are going to happen between the girl. I'm going to walk up and we're going to start a conversation. There's going to be some sexual tension and some pushing away going on. We're going to resolve and decide we like each other, but not completely. I'm going to seem a little hard to get and like high value, but I'm going to get to know her. I'm going to structure a way for us to go home. Right? That's going to happen in every interaction. Does that make sense? And so I'm thinking, how do I get to the next point? But I'm not thinking, what's all the material in between? Right? And the best example I've ever, ever seen of this is from improvisational comedy. Um, there's a, for an improvisational comedy show, when I was taking classes, there's this like structure. It's, it's called like a herald. Um, but basically, what you're going to do is you're going to go out on stage and you're going to play around some ideas. And then you're going to do three scenes about those ideas. And then you're going to do some random scene that, that plays on those three. Then you're going to do three more scenes about those ideas. And then you're going to do a random scene. And then you're going to do one scene that brings it all together. And that like makes this very cohesive, very interesting show. Now, going in every single time I watch a show, I know exactly how it's going to go scene by scene. I know the plot line. Right? That's plot line. But I have no idea what any of those scenes are going to be about. I have no idea what word the audience is going to shout out. I have no idea who's going to be in any of those scenes. Right? But I know every single one, what comes next, what comes next, what comes next. And so knowing that gives me, like, if I'm performing, gives me safety and the ability to like, take risks because I know that there's always this structure to fall back on. Does that kind of make sense? And think of it the same way in game. right? So it's not like I'm going to say this one line and this story, and then this line, and then this story, and then this line. Instead, it's there's going to be this dynamic between me and the girl. And then after that, there's going to be this dynamic, and this dynamic, and this dynamic. And because I know those next steps, it gives me the, the liberty to try things and take risks, because I know where to bring it back if they mess up. And I know those risks are risks that are moving it in the right direction instead of the wrong direction. Does that kind of make sense? So that's the way I look at game, is rather than look at it as like a stand-up comedy where everything's planned out, I look at it as improv comedy where the structure is very, very planned out, but the content is completely free. Right? And then even within that, though, um, with the improv comedy analogy, you still learn skills for all that structure. Right? So you may learn to do voices, and that makes you better at that structure. You may learn to pantomime, and that makes you better at that structure in improvisational comedy. In game, you learn to do push-pull, that makes you better. You learn how to qualify a girl. You learn how to read her blueprint. It makes you better. So it's all coming down to this structure, and then you're learning the skills to fill in that structure. And again, every single set, just like any improv show, every single one's completely different, but they're also all completely the same. Because that underlying structure and the base techniques you're using are the same every single time. Does that kind of make sense? Right? And at any point, if you're lost, you have a repertoire to fall back on. OK. So let's talk about finding your own style. How do you find your style in games? So we've talked about well, how many different styles of game. We talked about the, you know, the um, attractive characteristics. We talked about the W dating stuff, speed seduction stuff, structured game, three different, like two, like two and a half different forms, and unstructured kind of natural style game. How do you find your own style of game? Right? First thing I would say is imitate before you innovate. Right? So learn what works. Learn from people that have done things before. And don't just try things randomly. Try things from people that work. So for example, if you guys have seen some of my infield and like, you think that what I'm doing is good and you'd like to do it, be more likely to try something that you've seen me do than something completely random. Now, that does not mean to treat me as an absolute guru. It doesn't mean that just because I said something, you should say it. Or just because I did something, you should do it, especially without understanding the context. Right? Um, there's one that I remember. There's um, a video I put out a long time ago. Um, where I was running up to the girl and she was like being very hard to open. 
And I said, like, wow, I've never burned this many calories to talk to a girl before, as I'm like running up next to her, right? And in that context, it made total sense and it worked really well. Then I had a program where I had a student come in, and that was his default opener. He just run up to girls and be like, wow, I've never burned this many calories to talk to a girl before, right? Which one is completely out of context and doesn't make sense half the time. But two, it's actually inherently needy unless she's already been like obnoxiously hard to open, right? And so it fundamentally was, was wrong. And then he said, I got that from you. I'm like, no, you didn't. You didn't get that from me because that's not how I did it, right? So imitate stuff you see from me. Imitate your stuff you see from other guys that, are, that, that seem to be doing well. But don't be blind. The end result, like the end judge of any technique is you. Does that make sense? You are the end decider if it works. If it's worked for every single pickup coach in the world and it doesn't work for you, put it on the back burner as something to maybe try again later. But as long as it's not working for you, don't fucking do it. OK, does that make sense? So imitate, but imitate with intelligence. Imitate and try it and see if it works for you and see if it's congruent for you, because different people do have different, different styles of game. And then what's going to happen, once you've imitated enough things, you'll start innovating. You'll start coming up with your own things that are the similar structure to the things that have worked. So imitate before you innovate. And then the biggest thing I can say is, your style should get you to your goal. I'm not going to use names right now, because I don't want to name drop different pickup guys. But um, every single guy who I know who's good in pickup, they have different outcomes in mind from pickup. And their um, structure and their strategy gets them their outcome. Right? So for example, I know one guy who just wants to get laid a ton and doesn't really care very much about the quality. And so he has kind of a shotgun method. He's willing at the first sign of any kind of like resistance or rejection to be like, fuck next, and whatever. And he's very polarizing, very abrasive, and it works very well for him. Right? Other guys want only the hottest girls, and they don't care about anything less than a 10. And so they're willing to stay in a set for very, very long times and try really, really hard. They're willing to um, do a lot of like homework before the set, get social proof on their side, do things like that. And that works well for them. But they don't, don't get quite as much volume. Right? And that's their style that works for them. Um, I know one guy who's really good in, in pickup who actually probably cares more about um, how much he can get away with than he cares about actually getting laid. And so he has a style that's all about getting away with a lot of shit. Right? Um, and that works for him. Okay? The point is that whatever your style is should help you get your goal. So in order to determine your style, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, what's your goal? What is it you actually want about game? And this is something that I, I've said this at many events, and I, I guarantee people don't do this. What is it you actually want? What did you get in game for? What is your end result? Do you want lots of girls, or do you want one special girl? Do you want to have lots and lots of sex with lots of girls, or do you want to just have sex you know, every now and again with girls that you think are a little more special? Right? Um, do you want to have multiple long-term relationships, or do you want to have serial monogamous relationships? Um, do you have a particular ethnicity or body type that you like better? Right? Do you want your girls educated, or do you not give a damn? Right? <laughs> there are all these different things, all these different factors, and they matter because it's going to determine a lot in your game. So the first step in what's your style is, what type of girl do you want? Next step in what's your style is, what type of interaction do you want? Do you like really like supercharged, like super flirty sexual interactions? Some guys do. Some guys get nervous about that, they don't like it. Or do you like really like wordy kind of talk, talk, talk kind of interactions where you really spend your time and get to know a girl? Some guys really like that. If you want really sexually charged interactions, should you go more direct or more indirect? Probably a little more direct. If you want really conversational interactions, you should go more indirect or more direct? Indirect. More indirect, right? And along with that, next question is, what are you best at? Are you best at conversations, or are you best at that flirty stuff? Right? So all of this is going to play in. However, whatever style you choose, there are going to be certain elements that I think are always going to be the case. Okay? Um, number one, you're going to have to continuously implement trial and error. You're going to have to continuously take what you're doing, tweak things, try things, learn. So whatever style you adopt, you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to learn and grow. Okay, um, Whatever style you adopt, you're going to have to hit those three trigger points that I talked about. You're going to have to have access. You're going to have to have attraction. You're going to have to have follow through. So make sure that whatever style you have takes care of all those. Right? Most likely, if you're talking about a style where you're meeting strangers, as opposed to like a social circle style, you're probably going to have to lead with some level of like attraction and then follow it with some kind of comfort. Right? That's probably a given. Right? Um, whatever style you, um, you adopt, there has to be some congruence about your closing. Right? 
whatever style you adopt, there probably has to be a plot line. Right? There has to be some kind of a plot line or a narrative. So these elements are always going to be the case. Whatever, plot, whatever style you adopt, it's going to help you if you have a few canned things you can go back to. But whatever style you adopt, it's going to help you if you're not so structured you can't pay attention to the girl. Right? So these, con these, these elements are always going to be the case, but your particular style is going to be uniquely your own. And it all starts with what do you want and who you are. And then it starts with understanding all of these styles and knowing how to implement it. Okay. Um, so with that said, um, I wouldn't say that all of you can like go snap your fingers and go have a perfect game style. But I would say hopefully you guys have learned a lot about what the different styles are. You've learned a lot about what the elements that make games successful are. And hopefully you have all the tools now as you go take action to go learn and implement a style that will work well for you. If you could talk to yourself at 20 years old just for one minute, I'm just curious, what would you go back and tell yourself like as someone who's new in the game, like something to just remember, you know, this, this will get you through it all. Um, <laughs> um, I would tell myself two things. Um, I would say, I would say, one, never stop learning. Like, never get arrogant and think you know it all. Because there are definitely periods where anybody, any, when, when there's an established kind of style of game that everybody's doing, it's very easy to think it's all been discovered. It hasn't. A lot of, that's another thing I've heard a lot lately. Oh, everything in games has been discovered. Fuck, no, it hasn't. <laughs> Not even close. OK? So one thing that I would tell myself is, at, at 20, I already knew I didn't know shit. But like, I, I would tell myself, no matter how much you eventually think you know shit, you still don't know shit. Um, so that's one. And the other thing I would be saying is never forget how fun this is. Never forget how fun this is. Because for me in particular, having done game as a profession, um, there definitely are times where it can feel like work. Like you're dealing with a frustrating student or um, like when you, when you have to leave a hot girl to go teach, like the hot girl wants to go home with you, you have to go back to go teach, your genetics are like screaming at you. <laughs> like your genes are like, what the fuck are you doing to me, Todd? Um, but it's, it's good to keep it in perspective that game really is fun. Game really is beautiful. And um, there are times over my gaming career that I've fallen in and out of love with game. Um, and I can tell you, even, even when your results aren't as good, being in love with game and having fun is better than being out of love and getting better results. With that said, thank you guys so much for coming out. Yeah.